Hey, just uh, again, uh, just just uh, if you've been with us for a while, you'll you'll recognize these reminders. Please keep yourself on mute. Um, you, you, you're always free to use the chat window for questions. Where Adam will will keep an eye on the chat window and um, you know rec uh, you know ask any questions of of Frank. We'll get your questions answered. Um, again, same thing in chat. If you want to you want to you know you want us to go over anything uh, or, or clarify anything, feel feel free. Uh, the the the, um, the format of the program is we're going to go through the rules. Um, we're going to have a quick introduction to Raritan Yacht Club, and then we're going to um, open uh, a question and answer session with Frank. Um, okay, our introduction. Um, so Frank has been uh, around our club for a long time, always, always a very, very competitive sailor and, and uh, um, someone to watch. Uh, he sailed his whole life. He's very active or used to be very active and, and very successful on the J24 circuit. Um, he sailed J30s and um, a whole lot of other boats as, as you could read. Um, Scows, he's usually always available as a technician and he's, he's really superb. So um, let me uh, turn this over to Frank and um, you, you, you can, um, you can be in your presentation. Good evening, everybody. Uh, like I said, uh, my name is Frank Scalisi. I've um, been doing this a, a really long time. Um, kind of pride myself on, on knowing the rules and, and keeping up with our rules. Um, thank you, Luke, for the introduction. Um, we're going to kind of go through some stuff here. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Um, so first off, um, I definitely want to at least acknowledge and thank uh, U.S. Sailing, who we're going to kind of borrow, borrow some stuff from, uh, and they are the governing body that kind of controls our rules uh, as our body, so we definitely want to recognize U.S. Sailing, uh, and the other people I want to recognize is SailZing.com. Um, this uh, sales thing is nothing that I had even heard of until pretty recently um, because I started doing some more MC scout sailing. But they have a, a, an amazing website that they have going that's pretty much dedicated to education. Um, a lot of the stuff's kind of catered to dinghies, but all of it applies. Uh, we'll go through their site in a little bit, but I just wanted to at least uh, you know recognize them. We're definitely going to use some stuff from their website. So uh, I'd like to mention uh, the the people that we're going to at least reference. So uh, next up, I'm not gonna go to the, the um, so all right, knowing the rules, um, pretty much why the rules are basically important, um, safety, um, safety, safety, safety. The rules are written and the way they're written is pretty much to keep everybody from boats colliding, people getting injured um, and pretty much, and if you think of the rules, um, in a way of safety, a lot of the rules make sense. It's almost like driving a car. You have rules to drive your car, just, and they're basically pretty much designed around safety as well. And having cars not hit, the same rules pretty much apply for boats. Uh, it, it's really about keeping people safe and not having boats hit each other. Um, if everybody follows the rules, it allows you to anticipate other boats' actions, just like uh, you anticipate, you know, driving down a road that the other person on the, on the road's not going to just veer into your lane. I mean, there's that whole trust. Um, so knowing the rules is, is is good to know, part of your responsibility of controlling your boat. Uh, and then ultimately, a lot of the rules will drive a lot of tactical decisions, and you can use the rules uh, to your advantage to make sure that you're, you know, um, dealing with boat on boat situations in the right way that you can actually come out ahead uh, and not get yourself into some sticky situations. Uh, hey, the rules are, can, yes. Can I just ask you to put it on presentation mode? Oh, okay. I was gonna flip back a couple of little spots back and forth. That's why I was not doing that, but okay. Um, is that better? It's better, it's great. Okay. I'm going to go back to a couple of web pages. That's why they hadn't gotten too crazy. But um, all right, so let me, where was I? So the rules get updated every four years. Um, there's generally not been a lot of major, major changes in this version. Uh, there wasn't a lot of major, major changes in the previous version. Um, things that the kind of why that they did this every four years, we get changes in technology. 
Um, we get changes in different types of boats come out and become more popular. Um, we get changes in, in just tweaks of things that we've learned through experience um, that make the rules simpler. And, and generally with the rules over the last, I'd say the last four or five editions, they've really been focused on simplification. And you'll see that in a lot of changes in this year. Um, it's just about clarifying wording to make things easy for everybody to interpret. Um, so that's pretty, and, and what's in this year's changes is that's pretty much what's there. There's not a lot of big changes in the way that we're gonna sell our boats or the way the boats are gonna interact. Um, just a little other note on the rules. Um, everybody gets a little intimidated. This book is 108, the old, this is actually the old book. Is 185 pages. Um, it seems like it's a lot, but if you know 10 pages from this book, which is pretty much what's in part two, you can pretty much sell on a race course safely. Uh, between the definitions and part two, it's pretty much all you need. So don't get intimidated by this giant book uh, of rules. I mean, there's 20 pages in the book to just relate to windsurfer sailing. So, but if you're not going to windsurf race, you don't need to read or know that 20 pages of the book. And, and there's a lot of other appendices for team racing, match racing, um, organizational things. So don't get intimidated by seeing a, a big book. There's really part two, when boats meet, if you can understand those 10, 12 rules, uh, and it's literally they're on 10 pages, you can go out and sailboat race and with some confidence that you're not gonna, you're gonna follow the rules and not uh, avoid collisions and things like that. So um, so that's one of the things that people always get like a little hung up, I think when you start talking about the rules that uh, don't get too intimidated. There's really 10 rules you need to know. Um, so um, the new rules, I'm actually going to, um, you can find these in a couple of places. Um, we're going to, so if you go to the US sailing site, they have their US sailing page. Um, here, you can do a couple of things from their page. Uh, these, you can download, there is actually one of the better improvements that came out this year is they've developed a new uh, app for your smartphone for the rules. Um, this is a completely separate app that's outside of the old US sailing app that you have. Um, you can download it from here. You can download it from the App Store. I'm sure the Play Store as well. Um, also on here, there's some other some, some features here. Uh, they also give you a link to the student guide here as well. And this is pretty much, uh, if you click the student guide, gives you the pretty much the old rules with red out with red additions or strikeouts that show exactly what changed from the old version to the new version. So if um, I found this really useful and, it, and this is pretty much where I took a lot of my little snippets out because um, then you can pretty much see what's changed. And to me, this is wanting to know not just what the rules are, but I wanna know what changed. So this, this, this was very valuable. Uh, and that link you can, I believe, I'm not signed into my US selling account, so I believe you can get to this link for free. I don't know if it'll let you print it or not, but uh, this was kind of a good spot. So the other nice part, like I said, was the app. And I'm just gonna switch to my phone here for a second so that I can share my phone. Um, okay, so, uh, Pardon me, pull the app up. So this is the app. Um, the app has been, like I said, drastic. This is a new app that's just got the rules in it. So if you click just on the, the actual rules, it gives you the whole rules down to every uh, done by different parts. So if like, if you went to part two and pretty much the way they show anything in here right now um, is anything that's shaded it's, it's a little hard to see the shading probably on the zoom screen. You can see it a little better when you're actually looking at your phone. Anything that's shaded is what changed. So you can see the changes um, that occurred even looking in the app and, and seeing the full rules as they're written today as part of the app. I don't even have a copy of the book. Um, I've just been using the app and it's been great. Um, the other thing about the app, you can also get to the appeals book is also here. So the new appeals book, just like you can get into the uh, main book, you can get to the appeals book. Other benefits of the app. There's a whiteboard. 
and a little thing where you can actually take your little boats and you can put them on your thing and, and arrange them all in different arrangements. And it'll even let you step through a series of steps where you can boats can move through. So if, you, if you're getting involved in a protest or a thing, you can make an animation of what you think actually happened. Um, this is really a cool little option. I uh, played around with it a little bit. I thought I tried to save an animation. I don't know why it didn't save my animation, but I don't want to get into that too much without wasting a lot of time. Um, there's also a list of resources. Um, this resource, there's a resource on how to use the whiteboard. There is a significant amount of Dave Perry, and Dave's great about the rules, explanations on all of the changes of the rules. And each one of these is a video, and they're a couple minutes long. Uh, if you have the time or, or you really want to get into them, you can watch each one of Dave's kind of videos on the changes. Uh, there's also references on how to prepare for a protest and a defense should you end up in a protest. Um, odds of winning a protest. There's also tactical things here from North U. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's games, there's separate links for signals. So the app now has a lot of stuff all in one place. So I strongly suggest um, just download the app. Uh, you can even fill out a protest form on the app now. So you put your name, this is pretty much a blank form. You can start typing, start in. So you can actually, you know, paperless, you come back in, you don't have a form. Well, you now do. So you can even do a protest form on the app. So this is something new. This was something that was never around. Uh, I really think it's cool. Uh, and definitely, you know, like I said, I don't even have a paper copy because I didn't feel like wasting the paper and buying one um, with the app. I have it everywhere I go and it'll always be updated. So um, that's the app. All right, let me get back to my... Uh, so, um, so, all right, so I, I didn't know if the, the um, I didn't know if the phone capture was gonna work. So here's some apps like here, like th this is the animation I caught, these two boats were here. And then like, it, this was one and then instant two, you, they were able to move together. And so that was kind of playing around with the uh, whiteboard there a little bit. Um, and this, this is just the same things I was able to show you. So uh, other things that are also linkable off of that um, US sailing page is, um, if you want to know a little bit more about the details of all of the changes, um, Dave Perry did a lovely little write-up here. Um, oh, nope, wrong write-up of the significant changes that went through. So this is like a nine-page long document. It goes through everything that pretty much changed in a quick little interpretation of it. We're not going to go through and read each one because a lot of the things that change, I said, are you know, little procedural things or little things. We're, we're going to highlight the things that I feel are, are important. Um, and so a lot of, we're not going to go through every single one, uh, but it's here if you do want to go through it. Uh, if you're a more experienced racer, I would suggest taking your time and reading, you know, maybe the details a little bit more on each one. So um, that's another resource. It's also still there. And sales thing is the, is the next one. Um, so we have sales thing. So this is sales thing. Um, they have different sections. Uh, they kind of pride themselves on, be, on being a learning center. Uh, they do also sell some products here and there. So if you're looking for some small things, telltale things, not like big products, but they do sell some stuff to kind of help support themselves. But there are sections on here on boat preparation, um, upwind handling performance, tuning, smart sailing, strategies for, I know we're not really doing, talking about strategies and tactics today, but there's all videos and things on all of these things. Uh, we are gonna get into the, the rules section there because they have some great examples um, here. So this, this, like I said, this, uh, this website, I didn't even know existed until very recently. It's, and I, every time I'm on it, I find another thing that's uh, really helpful. You can register for the site, it's free. So um, if to get you to some things, because there's some rules quizzes and you can go through all kinds of uh, things. So, but we'll get back to looking at some of these later. When we're reviewing the rules, I'm pretty much gonna use um, their little animations and things because they could do a pretty much better job than if I tried to do them myself. So I, let's use the resource that we have available. So, um, all right, so now what we're gonna pretty much do, uh, and I know this might be uh, a little difficult for people that don't know the rules that in depth, is we're gonna go through the changes that I felt were important. Um, 
don't get hung up if you if you're new to the to the rules don't get hung up on these totally we're going to go into them a little more details but what i kind of wanted to do is give the people that do know the rules a little bit better um what i saw as the major changes as, as that was one of the focuses of this group so um the first the changes that pop up are in the definitions the definitions are very important to the rules um you can't understand the rules unless you know what the definitions are and anything that's in italics in the rules has a definition so starting finishes sailing the course um, that's pretty much means that there is a definition if the item is in italics so one of the big changes this year uh, was the definition of finish and the definition of start. Um, the same principles pretty much were changed. Um, well, the now a boat finishes after starting when any part of her hull, and you can see what's removed here, crew or equipment in normal position crosses the finishing line from the course side. Um, so pretty much with the changes here, the old rule was any part of the boat, the crew, a sail, a bowsprit, um, anything in its normal position, which was subjective, uh, which was why one of these, one of the reasons for this change, uh, cross the line of a finish line or a starting line, you pretty much would deem as crossing that line. Uh, if it was a finish, you would be finished. If it was a starting line, you'd be called OCS if it was over early or whatever. Um, so it used to be any part of hull, crew, boat, equipment. They've simplified it to hull. Uh, and hull, they talk about being pretty much the continuous part of the main structure of the boat. It pretty much is eliminating bow spritz, poles, sails, crew, um, anything that could be like retractable that goes in and out. So it pretty much simplifies for more for a race committee to be able to call one thing. Then I have to be looking up to see, did somebody's spinnaker just finish, you know, higher up the line than, you know, somebody's bow sprit down low on, on the other side of a line. So this is more of a simplification for, for race committees. It kind of also makes it fair for everybody. And there's none of this, you know, people letting sails out to cross lines early or, or things. Um, the other impetus for this uh, change is they're expecting some technology advancements where people might have sensors or monitors on their boat that will be attached to like the bow or a hull that will automatically call people over. Um, so that they're trying to get ahead of the technology curve. The America's Cup and some of the boats in the high end racing are already using some of that technology. Um, so they're trying to make it the, the rules available. So if it does come down to, you know, the more average seller, um, we can use that technology as well without wondering, having to mount a sensor at the end of your bow sprit, um, you'll be able to mount it to your bow in the same spot or hull. So that's the biggest kind of, um, two biggest changes, like I said, it applies essentially the same rule applies to the start as to the finish. I almost equate it to like uh, the football player carrying the ball now into the end zone. It's where the ball is and the ball is the hull. If the hull breaks the plane, that's what breaks the plane. So it's not the, it's not the football player's helmet. It's not his arm. It's not his whatever. It's when the ball crosses the plane. If you think of the, the hull of the boat being the ball. That's pretty much how it would change the rule. So, um, and like I said, that pretty much goes for calling both a finish or a start. And naturally, they 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 fill it up with the, the differences between the two. Uh, so that's one of the biggest changes, especially now that we have boats sailing uh, a lot more boats sailing with spritz and things. There is that little bit, you know, it's another ten feet of boat that's uh, not going to be called at a start or finish. Okay, um, a little change here to the definition of proper course. Um, they, like I said, a lot of this is just to uh, clean up some language. Uh, the boat would choose in order to sail the course and finish instead of um, just would sail. So you pretty much, it's, it's a little wording there. Um, sail the course actually was never a defined item. That's why this whole item is in red. Um, so this sale of the course was never definition, which was very strange. So they have now added it. Um, you can read it there. It pretty much didn't change anything that what it was implied to be before. Um, before it was like part of a rule and it was like referenced. 
Now, since it's a definition, each individual rule doesn't have to reference the other rule that defines sale of course. So it's, it's a simplification. Not much has changed in what it meant. So, but it, it is there now as a its own definition. Okay. Now the next ones are kind of um, bundled together and they involve uh, when boats do come in contact with each other and or exoneration for that and how these things changed. Um, this overall changes again is not a very big change. It's more organizational to the rules. Um, there is one big change that does kind of come into play with this so that it's gonna kind of come at the end. So pretty much rule 14 is avoiding contact. Um, there's a some white, pretty much this is cleaning this up because there, there was a multitude of where things were, were duplicated. So uh, you can see the changes here. Um, the term 20, rule 21 exoneration was removed and it actually gets replaced. You'll see on the next slide um, as now rule 43. Um, and we do 43. So, uh, so the, the change here is as a consequence of breaking a rule, a boat is compelled to, uh, by another boat to break a rule, the other boat is exonerated for her breach. That's pretty much the same spirit of what happens, but now you are automatically exonerated before if a boat forced you to hit a mark, right? the only way you could be exonerated for hitting that mark was to protest the other boat and have a protest committee exonerate you for hitting the mark. The way that they have rewritten this, the implication is you are automatically exonerated for breaking a rule that you were um, compelled to break. Um, you can still be protested for, um, breaking that rule, but the other boat or somebody would have to protest you to get you thrown out uh, that saying that you weren't entitled to an exoneration. And that's a big deal because th this should really help eliminate some of the protests that, you know, or, or touchy call or that, on, or that you almost have to file. Like if somebody forces you to hit a mark, you almost have you have to file that protest. You have to either do one of two things. You can do your 360 to exonerate yourself for hitting the mark, or you had to protest the boat that compelled you to hit the mark, and then you had to win, and then you had to get exonerated as part of the process. Um, and it kind of made you have to do things when you did nothing wrong, um, which which was kind of what this cleans up. Which is nice that you are automatically now exonerated. Uh, like it's, that, that doesn't mean you're totally clear from the woods if, if you exonerate yourself when you shouldn't have. Um, but if you feel like you should be exonerated because you were compelled to break a, this uh, a rule, you now can assume that. And that's the big difference. And it's, it's really the 43 to a boat exonerate for breaking the rule, need not take a penalty and shall not be penalized for breaking the rule. This is the probably the biggest game changer out of the changes from the old rules to the new rules. I see there's, there's a bunch of questions is that, uh, so here, this is pretty much, pretty much what I just said, uh, written out. This is from the Dave Perry. Dave Perry does go into this in detail because it was kind of important. Um, on explaining the difference between how the old exoneration works compared to the new. Uh, and it's basically based on, like I said, the, the, the changes they made to some of the sportsmanship kind of feelings of things. So um, that's, to me, was one of the biggest changes. And it makes sense. Um, you shouldn't have to go fight for your fight for your exoneration uh, if another boat fouled you. Uh, I don't know if this is there. Oh, so Frank, there? there was just okay. a couple of people were asking about what defines the hull? I think you covered the bowsprit specifically. Is that not being part of the hull? A bowsprit other... is, yeah. We're talking about pretty much the contiguous part of the hull that is, I mean, I would consider it on my J24 from the stem fitting to my, you know, to, to the stern. Uh, if you had a J105 or whatever, I would consider it that like stem fitting to, to the back of the boat, not including the pole. Yeah, nothing that's kind of sticking out past the main structure of the boat. 
spritz cells, crew. Um, the, it's funny that the term hull is not defined in the rules, but there are, the, the, there's, if you read through some of the things, there are some references that they make to what is, it's defined in the equipment side of one of the rules or something like that. So it's pretty much the main structure. And as long as you have a committee that's doing it consistently, then it doesn't really, you know, that's kind of the key too. Yeah, there, there's some other questions around that. And actually Trish read your mind saying USS, US sailing needs to define hull. Um, they, Sumner, Sumner is finishing with his rudder first. So he's asking if rudder on a J30 specifically would be part of the hull or not? I would say not your rudder, but the stern. Yeah. Another two feet, I would say, as that's um, kind of an appendage, that's a movable appendage that's off the back of the boat. I would say that's not part of your hull. So there's uh, one other question that um, is going to ask me to ask the audience. When you are putting a question in the chat, could you please just uh, define the rule that you're asking the question related to? Because sometimes uh, it's just hard to follow. But Martin asks, does that include missing a mark? So I think um, that's that's in your exoneration discussion. Um, if like uh, a mark is not there or, or you're forced to miss a mark because of another boat's actions. Um, I guess it would have, I mean, you're being much exonerated. Well, then you're not technically sailing the course because your string rule doesn't work. Um, I believe it would probably get you exonerated for hitting a buoy. I don't believe it would get you exonerated for missing a mark altogether. Yeah, I agree. I think I think using the string theory is the simplest way to follow. Right, because uh, you're gonna you, then you're not going to technically sell the course, which it brings up a whole another set of circumstances. Yeah, um, I'm just gonna ask. I, I think there's color commentary here where someone says rule 18 is hardly a touchy foul, so I, I don't know that that needs further. Um, yeah. We'll get into 18 more. Um, a little bit, we'll definitely get touch, get into 18 a little bit in a little I, more detail. Frank, um, I think we've covered the question, so why don't you okay. go move on, please? Um, the other kind of change in sec in uh, port two um, is 16.2. This is not something that's probably going to generally come up. Um, it's kind of almost like a match racing kind of thing, or you might see it in some other different situations. So it pretty much says, uh, in addition, um, rule 16 is pretty much changing course. Um, it's pretty much deals with the right away boat changing course. So 16.2 has been changed. Uh, it says, in addition, on a beat to windward, when um, a port tack boat is keeping clear to sail uh, past the stern to leeward of a starboard tack boat, the starboard tack boat shall not Bear away uh, if, as a result, the port tech boat must change course immediately to keep, continue keeping clear. It's pretty much saying if you're on starboard, you can't dial down into the guy that's trying to duck you to avoid you to make it more difficult or make it so that the boat that's trying to avoid you uh, by sailing underneath you um, yeah, to keep clear. So uh, it's pretty much a, like a, I don't know, dial down is almost a te the technical term for it. You pretty much can't steer down at about the uh, on even though you're on starboard tack and you're the right away boat you can't change your course to make it more difficult for the port tack boat to sail beneath you um it just pretty much this has always been understood but it's been cleaned up a little bit uh like i said a lot of the language is just to clean up some things so um those are the major changes um to the rules that i felt we're needing some highlighting. There's also been some, um, I, I don't have slides on them, but there's also been some good organizational changes based on having good sample NORs. There's a whole uh, appendix for that sample SI. So if you're running a race, um, they've done a good job of updating some of those um, parts of the book. 
to just clean those up and give you a nice like template to work with. So if you you know if you're hosting a regatta, you need to start writing. Everybody, where do you start? Well, now there's a nice pretty template that you can start with that makes sure that you pretty much add all the things that you sh that should be there. Um, you can kind of do like a fill in the blank form now, which does make running a regatta a little easier. Um, but a lot of the, like I say, a lot of the changes were very much procedural. There's some there's some minor changes to um, protest hearings taking, protest committees taking, um, facts and things like that. Uh, but the the average person is still kind of learning those rules. If you're not going to be on a serving on a protest committee, don't probably need to know the differences right now. Um, Excuse me a second. Uh, so Frank, just while you're taking a short break, uh, Rand has asked a question related uh, to 16.2. It's actually somewhat of a commentary. And he says, okay. it seems to be an anti-hunting rule, which we sometimes use to force uh, a port tack boat to tack early. So- Well, it, it, well it, what, they, what the, what was here? Yes, it's kind of a little bit of an anti-hunting rule. Uh, yes, and you can still. I don't believe it. The, I, to my interpretation, is is it doesn't stop you from doing the the port tack boat still sailing on a close hold course, and you fall off a couple of degrees to accelerate at them and close the distance. That's not what this rule is saying. You can't do. But what they're saying is once that boat is starting to bear off, the port tack boat is bearing off to go below you. That, now that you pretty much limit you to making it more difficult at that point. Like once the, the, the port tech boat is gone, trying to avoid, um, look, that's why it's keeping clear by sailing to pass to leeward of a starboard tech boat, um, pretty much means you can't hunt them anymore. Um, but it, I know what Rand's talking about. A lot of times you see, you see a guy coming and you want to speed up a little bit and this way you kind of dive at him at him, make him tack a little sooner if you think they're going to tack. That is still allowed as long as you don't, course change in a way that the port tech boat can no longer keep clear. Um, so that I don't think that's not eliminating that, but it's saying once somebody has made that option to pass to leeward of you, you can't make it more difficult for them. Does that kind of answer your question, Rand? Rand, if you want to come off mute, just to answer, you can. Yeah, it seems, you know, a lot of times, sometimes we'll want to protect a certain side of the course. So you may not want him to go behind you. You'd rather have him tack, you know, and you can protect, you know, and it's a maneuver that we've done a lot. I mean, you can't just all of a sudden bear off at him, but you can sort of come down a few degrees and make him think about tacking early as opposed to ducking you. Yes. And that's, yeah, because at that point, you know, he the, 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 usually when that's happening, the port tech boat is, you know, is not, if they're really going to think about tacking, they're not going to start to bear off to pass the leeward of you. Um, but you, yeah, so you, you could still do that little bit. I know you move, like somebody's coming that, yeah, we, we want them to leave out. So you, you kind of make it kind of closer, but that's fine. As long as you don't do it in a manner that, you know, stops the other boat from keeping clear. And I think that addresses Stephen Warren has a similar comment that you still can protect from a safe leeward by bear, uh, bearing off on starboard. So I think yeah. that's very really similar. Um, but it, uh, pretty much the thing is once you, once the other, once the port tech boat starts to, you know, duck you and, and is going behind you, you can't keep turning down to make it so that they can't duck you. It's not so much forcing them to tack sooner. It's stopping them from ducking, stopping them from passing to leeward of you. And. Angelo is bringing up a point about the rudder um, being important to consider as part of the hull when you're over early, such that when you're returning, uh, does your rudder actually have to clear for you to be considered all clear and back on the correct side? Uh, the whole boat has to clear to get back on the course side. I believe uh, we can go look, but I'm pretty sure that was the. Why is my, let me add it. I don't think that's really changed. It's, we'll, we'll go to start, definition of start again. We'll look at the whole, so I don't have just a snip. Uh, Steven, you're not by chance on Firefly, are you? 
There's also why you're looking, Frank. Coach Dodds, when our hall having me and Tyler preset start a sliding line, or at her after starting, had complied with the plus any part of her hall crosses the line from the preset center, of course. But uh, oh, that's it. Um, it's got to be in there. Um, 30.1 is the other. And just while you're looking, John has uh, a question. I'm not sure I fully understand it, but it says comment on case 50. Uh, and I don't know if I have a case book open to do. I can I can look. Um, I, I I say stay with your presentation. We can look right. at that. We can look at that later. And Angelo actually found Rule 29-1, yeah. which states the hull has to cross the pre-start. But the hull of the each, yeah, here it is. The hull of each boat shell has been completely on the preset side or starting line or one of its extensions. So thank you. Yeah. And, and John, if you have others, just put it in the chat about your question and then we'll address it. But Frank, I'd suggest we move to the next topic, please. Okay, so that those are the, the, the big changes. Um, now, I mean, I could pretty much start uh, we can we could pretty much dive down into the, the, those 10 basic rules um, that I think are the most important and we'll go through some of those animations and things we'll go through a couple of them and then uh, we're gonna we'll do a little presentation for Raritan and if you want to come back to do more like I said we'll definitely come back if people got more and more questions so uh, pretty much for these I, I I was going to make slides but sales thing does such a good job um, uh, we're pretty much just going to use what they have. Uh, it, it's it would be pretty much duplicating what they have anyway. They're 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 really good uh, with having these available for them. They're available to everybody. They're free, so we're we're not like uh, stealing anybody's things here. That they're, they're really about educating people. So um, okay, so the first rule in section uh, two when boats meet is rule ten. Rule ten pretty much is the first rule that you're going to look to apply when two boats are meeting on a race course. Rule 10 is opposite tax, pretty much means a boat on starboard tech has rights over a boat on port tech. Um, this is basic first thing that you should ever ask yourself when two boats are coming together right, in, in an open water situation, who's on what tack? And the first definer is starboard tack wins um, over, over a boat that's on port tack. So sim very simple. Uh, we'll watch, we can watch a little one of the animations here. So here, here's, a, here's a, the green boat. It is the, it pretty much assume on all of these drawings that the wind is coming from the top of the page. Um, so these are all pretty much the same kind of things. You have boats sailing upwind. The green boat is on starboard tack. The blue boat's on port tack. Uh, in the first scenario, uh, the green boat doesn't feel like the blue boat has really kept clear without him having to change course to avoid a collision. Um, and, and the nice part about all these animations, and you can go through them all, uh, you can even get, there's a little answer button. So you can pretty much answer each one. It gives you the rule. Um, so pretty much this will tell you blue should have been penalized because he did not keep clear. Green started to tack as obliged by rule 14 to avoid collision. Uh, the change of course was caused by blue's failure to keep clear under rule 10. So that's how you get to this little animation here. Um, like I said, these little tools here and for each rule, there is a, uh, a reasonable uh, little, there's, a, there's five or six animations for each rule. So. This one comes up with, um, just because th th this one happens tactically, we, we talked about making tactical decisions based on the rules. Um, if you're the starboard tack boat and you're the green boat and you really wanna keep going straight, but the red boat's coming and you feel that the red boat might tack on you or tack right underneath you and to stop you from going the direction you wanna go, you can let that boat go and tell them to cross. And just like in this picture, you see the green boat actually with the right away boat gets out of the way of the, the, the red boat. Um, but this is perfectly legal. And, and the kind of the twist here is could somebody else protest you for letting, for, could somebody protest the green boat for letting the red boat break the rules? Uh, and the answer is no, because the green boat made the decision to, you know, 
give away his right away to the red boat and that's his obligation. So this is one of those tactical ones that, that uh, you know, Ram is coming up of, I wanna keep going straight, uh, but I don't wanna get tacked on. So you let people go. Uh, this one comes up quite often. Um, okay, now this, these are the first ones were upwind. So downwind, we actually now get the same definition um, of two boats now coming together. You can see the, the blue boat has their boom over the port side. So they are technically on starboard tack. Uh, the yellow boat has their boom over the starboard side and they are technically on port tack. So as the two boats come together, even though they're sailing by the lee, uh, your tack is determined by your main boom position. And so the boat uh, in yellow would be protested and, and would uh, be DSQ'd in this situation for breaking rule 10. Um, so over to, and as we go a little, uh, that's, a, that's not the best. So now here's the same kind of thing of the, like we said, upwind, downwind. So um, the first thing, even though the boats are sailing in opposite directions, the first rule that's gonna apply um, is what boat is on what tack um, at the time of the incident. So here the boat's on starboard, uh, the green boat's on starboard, the red, the red boat's on port, the green boat jives to get out of his way to avoid the collision. Um, and so the red boat would be disqualified for breaking rule 10. So that's 10, 10 is simple. And remember 10 is not going to apply in, in some in a current couple situations like mock roundings and things like that if you're, maybe if you're in the zone but generally the first rule of thumb when two boats meet uh, is rule 10 and if the boats are on opposite tacks it's fairly simple uh, so that's 10 so that's uh, so now if boats are not hey, Frank uh, yes I actually pulled up case 50 and basically it's a port starboard situation where port uh, felt they were crossing S um, and so did so. S bore away, stating that they were trying to avoid a collision with P, uh, flew the protest flag, then hailed protest. Um, I, the protest committee dismissed S, stating that the need to change course could not be substantiated by the conflicting testimony of the helmsman. Okay, yeah, that, that's one of those judgment calls. Generally, I, I, most of the time, the race committees and things generally side with the guy on starboard. So uh, it depends, and it's an interpretation maybe how, right, how, the, how the committee saw the exact, like I said, it just seemed like an evidence issue or they couldn't determine the exact position. Um, if you're the boat on starboard and you have to make a substantial course change or, or whatever, avoid, um, you really have, if you really feel like you were fouled, you pretty much can't lose. You're never going to get thrown out unless you actually hit somebody. Um, but you're not necessarily going to win all them all unless you, you really do have to prove that you did change course in some way or another. Um, it's a judgment thing and, and depending on the boats or wind conditions, um, if it's really windy, you can definitely claim that, you know, if it, getting the boats really close was a little too dangerous uh, and you erred on the side of that, you know, if, if it's or if it's blowing five and you're in dinghies, you know, the crossings and things are going to be a little closer that you're not going to get it away with that, that you might not get a foul on. So, um, yeah, I, that's I kind of my unusual. interpretation on that. I think it's unusual for, um, P to have won, won that protest? Yes, uh, it's pretty much, yeah. I, I think it just- I was a little, that, sorry, I was a little shocked that you told me that P won that protest actually, because general, there, there's some general assumptions that start happening when you talk about a boat, boat on stop and boat on port, but, um, and not always, not always right, but those kind of things happen. Okay, so now uh, the next rule, which is pretty much simple, if boats aren't on opposite tacks, then they must be on the same tack. So pretty much the rules now address what happens to boats that are on the same tack. Uh, rule 11 is pretty much on the same tack and overlapped. So um, like I said before, there's like a, each one of these videos is a couple of minutes long too. You can do those. Or like I said, we're not gonna do those. We'll just look at some of the definitions. So um, that make life easier. So let me see if I can blow this up a little bit more so that people can see a little bit better. Does that help a little bit, John? Yes, Frank, sorry, I was on mute. It's, it's okay. good. 
Okay. So maybe this is all right. So clear definitions. We get some definitions in here. So when boats are on the same tack and overlapped, the windward boat, the boat closer to the wind, shall keep clear of a leeward boat. Okay, so there's some definitions in here, clear stern, clear ahead, overlapped. Um, these should, like I said, it's very hard to, to know the rules without knowing the definitions. So um, get read the definitions over a couple of times if, if you're not sure on a couple of these. Um, a boat is clear astern of another when our hull and equipment in normal position is behind the line, a beam from the aftmost point of the other boat's hull and equipment in normal position. Uh, the boat is clear, the other boat is clear ahead. Uh, they overlap when neither is clear astern. So pretty much when the one thing is a, a, either you're clear ahead or you become overlapped because you're no longer clear ahead. And, and this is one of these ones, the wording has changed over years, but this is kind of the most simplified way they've gotten it to now. Um, however, they also overlapped when a boat between them overlaps both. This is kind of saying there's a pass through, like if boat one, uh, we'll look at here a couple of the little diagram. If one boat's overlapped with another, then that boat's technically overlapped with the ring. So, uh, we'll look at here. So we got three boats here. Um, some of them are overlapped. Some of them are not. So boat one at the bottom. Let's kind of we'll kind of work our way up here. Boat one, you see the not line ninety degrees of the the aftmost part of that boat doesn't touch the yellow boat. So the gray boat does not touch the yellow boat. So the gray boat is clear ahead. Now if he's clear ahead of the yellow, he's probably obviously clear ahead of the blue and the green. So the gray boat is pretty much clear ahead um, of the other three. So then you start coming back to us and let's look at the yellow boat. So the yellow boat now, if you draw the line up the back of the yellow boat perpendicular, hits the bow of the blue boat. So now there is an overlap between the blue boat and the yellow boat. So these two boats, the blue and the yellow are now overlapped. And pretty much the same thing with the green. So the green, if you could draw the line off the back of the blue boat, catches the bow of the green boat. So um, what the, the middle part there was saying the pass through is, is because the green boat is overlapped with the blue boat and the blue boats overlapped with the yellow boat, the green boats overlapped with the yellow boat as well. So that's kind of that pass through feature that's in the middle of the rule there. Um, that's it, when a boat, overlapped both. So that's kind of the definition of that. Um, these times also apply to boats on the same tack. Uh, and you can read the rest of the rule there. So that's pretty much being overlapped. Okay. Uh, we're not going to go through that. We'll look a little. So here's a little upwind. Well, we just, I don't like that example. That's, that's, that's not great. So, so we'll use this one. So We'll use another downwind example here. So you have blue and yellow sailing downwind. Yellow was heading up to get to a pluff. Blue did not see. Blue's boom contacts yellow stern. So at you know, at, at pretty much this entire time, if you if you, if you even look back at position one and you drew a line off of you know the yellow boat stern, it would pretty much catch the bow of the blue boat. So these boats are overlapped. Um and rule 11 applies to them pretty much the whole time in each of these series. And yellow is sailing, you know, yellow's course change isn't drastic enough that blue can't, you know, avoid this. Blue just pretty much holds its course until the distance between them deteriorates without taking any action to avoid the yellow boat. So yellow boat was right and the uh, blue boat should be disqualified. So um, Starting line. So starting line, this is kind of the old barging rule here. Uh, and this is pretty much a definition of the leeward boat having right away. The, the yellow boat is a leeward boat. The blue boat is the windward boat. They are overlapped is pretty much through all sequences here. Uh, and the yellow boat has their right away and they do not have to let the blue boat in uh, because they were overlapped before. They're not changing course. They're not squeezing the blue boat out too late. Um, the yellow boats are sailing straight with their rights. So the blue boat has to avoid. Um, that's the old barging rule, but that applies that way too. So now that's 11. Um, 11 pretty much is, is quick to determine that. So next thing, um, 
that's when both are overlapped. So what's the next thing that can happen? The next thing that can happen is if you're on the same tack and you're not overlapped. So uh, that's pretty much the only third situation that you can end up in uh, in open water. You can either be on opposite tacks or you can be on the same tack and overlapped or the same tack and not overlapped. Those are three, I mean, if you really pretty, pretty much try and I'm not talking about like a mark rounding or anything, put boats uh, on, a, on a race course somewhere. Those are the only three situations that a boat can exist in. And once you identify those three, you can pretty quickly apply the rules. And that's kind of what the, 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 the emphasis is, it, identifying what the situation is first and then applying quickly those rules. But you can only be in those three situations. Um, so rule 12 is pretty much not overlapped. If you're not overlapped, um, you're pretty much, a, going to be ahead and astern of each other, kind of like the two boats here at position one. Um, the yellow boat is clearly is clear astern of the blue boat. There is no overlap, and which pretty much protects the blue boat from getting sailed into from behind. So the, the yellow boat can't just rear end uh, the blue boat, kind of like driving rules. This is another one I could equate to driving rules. You, you can't you, know, you can't just rear end, you got a guy stopped in front of you at a, at a light, you can't just rear end them, you're, you're always wrong. Or, or you're driving down the highway and you just can't push somebody out of the way from right behind. I mean, you're, you're always wrong if you hit somebody from clear astern. In a car, in a boat, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's kind of almost, that they, they used to be like an overtaking thing, but they, they, they've kind of simplified that over the years to break it down to the three scenarios. You're either clear ahead or you're overlapped. Um, or you're on an opposite tack. So pretty much this one's pretty simple. Like I said, it's another safety thing. If you think about the safety of things, the guy from behind, you can't just get run over from behind because how do you defend yourself? So that's the safety issue to this one. Um, if you think about the safety issue to rule 11 as well, um, two boats on the same tack, who's, who's got, and they're sailing upwind, who's got the more, who's got a safer way to stop? the boat to windward could always just head up into the wind and stop. Their, their exit in a, in a safety situation, they have an out. The boat to windward could always just turn up and sail into the wind and stop. So their safety valve is up. That's why the windward boat is the giveaway boat. Um, it, it's just about safety. So, and just like 12 is about safety as well. You think what, who the safest situation is and how they apply. Um, Okay, so now we're gonna to get to some things that what's happening as things change when boats meet. I mean, pretty much the first three rules of people kind of sailing straight lines. Um, the next couple of rules deal with changing course. Um, rule 13 uh, is while tacking. Um, pretty much while you're in the middle of attack, you have no rights over anybody because you're making a drastic course change. Um, that you know, people, you, you're pretty much tacking. You, that should not have to cause anybody else to avoid you while you're tacking. So, um, it's a it's a it's a pretty simple concept. I mean, you can't just turn your boat into somebody. So that it's it's another thing back to like safety. If you're just sailing along, you can't just tack your boat into somebody because that you're not giving somebody an out or a way to, to, to a way to stay safe and to avoid you. So. Um, Pretty much tacking. So if you look at this little di diagram here, so so boat two here, about the, the blue boat is, is is tacking from port to starboard. The yellow boat through positions one and two is pretty much sailing in, in, in their straight line like they have their rights to do as the starboard tack boat. The blue boat uh, tacks a little too close, causing the yellow boat to alter the course to avoid a collision. So uh, the blue boat broke rule 13 causing the yellow boat to avoid while they were still tacking. Now in tacking is it was one of those definitions, there's a definition for tacking. Um, you pretty much are tacking from the time if you're sailing upwind after a start from the moment you leave cl from, from close hauled um, and, and until she's on close hauled course on the new tack. Uh, so pretty much, uh, that's tacking, which pretty much, like I said, it's another safety thing. You, you can't turn your boat and, and do something that's uh, not allowing another boat to keep clear. Um, and this is just another example of that. This is like almost kind of like the rant thing we talked about before, like how you dial, you could maybe come down at the guy a little bit to make him tack a little earlier. Uh, 
But this is that's a close call. Uh, it's it's all about when the blue boat completes his tack. Does he complete his tack before the yellow boat has to alter course? And that's one of those ticky tacky judgment kind of calls, kind of things that that happens in there. Um, so this is a, the, and you got another tacking into a spot here. Uh, we're not. That's that's kind of a. We're not going to go too crazy. We want to. I want to get through more of them than did to look at. So too Frank, many before you go off that, there actually was a question. Sure. Uh, related to the start that might be good to look at with that graphic. Okay. But basically, it is rule 16.2 before the start, can a boat on port tack approach a point at the stern of a starboard tack boat and force them over early by not allowing starboard to change course to avoid the line? So I, I think this is actually similar to the, the, what you just showed. Is, is oh, similar this here? To, yeah, I, I think that actually depicts the example. I'm not positive, but I think that's what they mean. Well, it, it, it's a combination of things. So it, it, you need to complete, the, the blue boat should have to complete his tack, acquire right away under rule 15, and then give the yellow boat a chance to alter course to comply. I don't see how that happens in this scenario in giving the yellow boat a real chance to avoid hitting blue. Um, See, he's at yeah, that's blue's tax to leeward of yellow and hails yellow to keep it up. Yellow changes course for legend blue book 13, um, changing course. So if you want to see the, let's see, we can get the answer. Oh, did we get, get the answer? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, I think I said blue should take the penalty. Yeah, is what she said. Ron, I'm not sure if that answers your question. If it does, great. If not, if you want to come off mute, you're more than welcome to. Hello, how you doing? You're on. Hey, that that really wasn't it. It had nothing to do with that. I mean, I you know the logic is simple. If you're on Rule 13, you know you know you, you don't have any rights till you're on your close old course. Right. The question had to do with 16-2. Uh, uh, if I'm a port tack approacher and I'm coming down the line, I don't tack at all. I point at the stern of a starboard tacker, and let's just say the current's pushing him over the line. He wants to come back, and I'm holding him out because he now can't change course to come down. This goes back. It's to ports. It. That's port starboard. You're, you're not even. No, no, no. Port starboard. I'm. I'm coming. I'm a port tech approach. I've moved to look. I pointed at his stern, and now he wants to come back down. He wants to change course, to to avoid the line. But he has to point at me. Can he do that? Well, there's no. Well, he couldn't do it in a way that if, if you were already avoiding him. And we're doing it. If he changed course so drastically that that you could no longer avoid him, uh, you could see the, the starboard tech boat getting penalized. Um, I'm, I'm just saying that if I if somebody's there, everybody's coming up to the line like they always do. There's five boats coming up the line. You're a port tech approach. You point at the last guy's stern. He can't come down. Is he pushing everybody over? <sighs> I guess you're gonna have a hard time. They're gonna, you're really gonna have to prove Did that they throw the, you <laughs> go in, you go in with the onus. I, I, I was when you go into a, any protest hearing and with the words out of your first mouth, well, well, I was on port and everybody was on starboard. <laughs> yeah, you're already setting yourself up that you now need to prove something. You know, you know, you almost need to start proving your innocence. Um, you're almost guilty until proven innocent. Yeah, and I know that's not the way it should work, but well, you're trying to avoid a problem, but you know, right. they, I, I get it. Um, yeah, but that's a weird one. I could really, I mean, you'd have to make sure you're keeping clear that I mean, the starboard tech boat's still going to have their rights to sail, you know, where they want to sail, but they couldn't, like, you know, like pull the tiller to their chest and turn the boat into you. Now, that that would be a foul. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, and that pretty much applies to a lot of situations where even though you're the right of way boat, you you pretty, and that's what 16 is all about. Even though you're the right of way boat, you can't do something so drastic that stops another boat from being able to keep clear. And that's the spirit of 16. Uh, I mean, the, the, the letter of the law is a little different, but the, the, the rules, basically the intention is 
even though you're the right of way boat, you can't do something so drastic to cause another boat from keeping clear of you. And I think it'd be interesting in the protest room. You would have have to demonstrate that, that somebody made a drastic court, yeah, drastic exactly. course change at you to make exactly. you really kind of go. Um, I, it's like eight or four. I don't know if you want to do. Does, do you want to do your? Uh, Adam want to do his thing, and then we can come back to these a couple of minutes to give people a second. Or what do you want to do, John? Yeah, why don't we do that? And folks, if, if you have a specific rule that you want us to cover, uh, or several that you want us to cover, and or situations like what we're talking about, put it in the chat, and we'll during uh, during the next few minutes, we're just going to give a short uh, club promo. And uh, then we'll give us time to look at what you want us to look at and we'll make the decision. So, uh, yeah, like I said, I got a couple of, we can go through, we can go through a couple more of these for, for 18, for a couple of the other rules. Uh, I got a couple of little videos we can look at real quick, but uh, I, I have more stuff, but I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to drag it on for everybody without getting uh, Adam a chance to do his, do his yeah. thing. So. so why don't we hand it over okay. to Adam for, for two or three minutes and then come right back. But again, folks, if you want us to cover something specific, please put it in the chat session and we'll do so. All right. Thanks everybody for joining us. Great presentation, very engaging. Thanks a lot, Frank. Uh, a lot of participants uh, registered from multiple channels that they found out about us and not everybody is uh, RYC members. So we just wanted to give a quick rundown of who we are and what we do. Um, obviously we like to race sailboats. Um, we're very old yacht club located in Perth Amboy. Uh, been around for a while, tracing routes back to 1865. Um, we have something for everybody. So in addition to uh, social events, uh, which we're starting to see more of this year as things start to loosen up and uh, a nice galley on site overlooking the bay at the member's disposal. Um, frequent racing uh very relevant for tonight's topic wednesday night race series um multiple weekend races and regattas over the sailing season uh, also some cruising events around the bay uh, getting together for the cruising sailors uh, we do have a very nice shared boating program with uh, four colgate 26s and now a new addition is a catalina 250 uh, is a cruising boat for use for the members uh, so it's all right there in the water, ready to go. Uh, women's sailing program, so that uh, we can benefit as much as we can from the great experience uh, a lot of our women experienced sailors have. Uh, try to give every, try to share knowledge and get everyone on the water. Uh, summer sailing classes, uh, both for an adult learn to sail program as well as the junior sailing. So you'll often see the. Opti's and the JY's out on the water uh, for the summer camp. Um, we have a affiliation with the American Sailing Association and we're starting to offer those courses again this summer, starting with ASA 101, the basic keel boat and running up into the bare boat certifications. And that's uh, most of the sailing season, which runs from May through October every year. And then as it gets colder and the boats come out of the water, uh, we don't stop sailing. We'll do some frostbiting uh, over the winter in the, a fleet of uh, JY-15-1 design dinghies. And then as it gets too cold, even for the frostbiters, we'll put the radio controlled lasers in the water and have some fierce competition, uh, hopefully dry uh, from the dock. Um, so always a, a way to get out on the water, enjoy the bay, uh, build relationships, um, and teamwork and uh the club is there you know something for everybody and you can do all of it if you want to uh, even uh, a lot of great mooring field for if you eventually you, if you had a boat that you wanted to put in the water uh, you can participate that way as well so thanks again for joining us uh, you'll be getting uh some follow-up emails with the recordings you want me to go uh, to the next future slide, events Adam? Do we have another slide? Yeah. Okay. And uh, some future events uh, from the educational series that we've been putting on. Uh, we're doing a series for offshore racing. 
So a lot of the topics are related toward uh, racing as well as uh, offshore. So the next series, the next uh, session coming up, May 18th is a Tuesday at seven. Uh, medicine and first aid for offshore sailors. That's uh, hosted by Dr. Nackman, who's an experienced offshore sailor himself. Because um, a lot of times you're out on the water and all you have is you, your boat and your crew. So you got to work through it. And this will be some really interesting tidbits uh, and uh, following up on as we're getting closer to our seminal event for the offshore racing series, we have uh, everything you wanted to know about crewing in an offshore race, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, this is uh, May 25th, which is also a Tuesday at 7, uh, trying to help everyone to feel more comfortable joining an offshore crew. Uh, and then by taking the educational series that we have for offshore racing. Uh, we're hoping that uh, we'll get some people interested in offshore racing. And then uh, for club members, we're gonna try to launch a campaign around the along Long Island race this summer. Uh, try to put some of that uh, good knowledge to use. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, so that's it for right now. So if we can go back to Frank. Yeah, great. And and Rand has asked, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, Frank, but basically he's asked um, if you can discuss establishing overlap downwind going from clear stern, you see, you can see it. So you're on mute, sir. Yeah, that's 17. We can look at 17. 17 is one of the more important ones that was kind of added and changed for probably that one came in two or three changes ago, but uh, some it's definitely a good restriction and something we could look at. But uh, so let's uh, so thirteen. Like I said, we'll go back to into this really quick. Uh, we're gonna go through a couple of these. Like I said, we'll we'll, we'll take as much time as you, as we can here. Uh, I don't mind sitting hanging out and doing too much of these. So it'll be fun. Uh, what did I do? Uh, Let's see, we take check. Oh, the answer is taking us back to do that. Okay, so that's 13. Uh, we're gonna just keep cruising through here a little bit. Okay, 14. And well, they do 14 and 15 together, uh, which is fine. 14 is pretty simple. Don't hit anything. <laughs> um, are, you, are you clicking the share or have oh, you? Oh, did I not share? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I did my share. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, okay. 14, 14 is pretty simple. Like I just said, don't hit anything. Um, rule one, avoid contact at all costs, even when you're right. Um, putting boats back together is not good. Putting, hitting people to prove a point um, in, a, in a rule situation will also get yourself thrown out very quickly. Um, you can very easily, you know, but even though you're right, uh, if you, they prove that you could have avoided causing a serious collision, um, you could very easily just as quick be thrown out of a race, even though you were correct or um, so that th this is something that they've stressed year and years over the things is don't hit anything. Um, so there's some definition. Can we use whoever that is or whatever? Um, okay, so, and this is, we, we kind of went over some of these changes before. Can we, I don't know who that is, Adam. Can you see, figure out who that is and? Not hearing it. No? Oh, I was hearing some background noise that didn't, what wasn't very nice. Okay. That's strange. Okay. Is it a protest? <laughs> no, it's something. Weird coming through my headset. <laughs> um, okay, so 14, like I said, it's pretty much don't hit anything. Um, there's a lot of cases to do here. Um, try to avoid putting boats together is a bad thing. Uh, like I said, you can be even thrown out. You can look at the restrictions. We looked at 14 before for some stuff. Uh, now 15 is kind of important. 15 is acquiring right away. So a boat that is acquiring right away pretty much means as the right away is changing, as you are completing your tack onto starboard tack, and all of a sudden now you're the right away boat. They, they're, they're pretty much says there needs to be a little bit of time in there that while you were acquiring your right of way, 
that the other boats need to keep clear. So pretty much you kind of almost as a, as a, as a good example. Um, so here, here, here's a small hole in a starting line, right? Um, so green is approaching the starting line. You know, all the boats are lined up. Green comes in very quickly from behind uh, and expects yellow to keep clear as the windward boat. Now, green only establishes the overlap once his bow crosses the, the, the perpendicular line behind the yellow boat. Now, for how long did that overlap exist that the yellow boat had time to get out of the way of the green boat who just acquired right of way, it, it, it pretty much puts limitations on what the right of way boat can do. So it pretty much says he can't just go in there the split second the overlap's established, just go hit the yellow boat and go, ah, that's a foul. You need to establish the overlap, turn on rule, that uh, turning on rule 11, now, once rule 11 is on, now you need to give the yellow boat time to avoid the green boat. And if your actions, even as the green boat, do not give that yellow boat time and opportunity to do that, you're wrong being the green boat, even though you had the right of way. That's pretty much what's saying. It's pretty much 15 controls as rules are getting turned on and off, as an overlap is established, as you establish yourself on port tack, as you... Um, do things that you can't do them so close to another boat that doesn't give that boat a chance to avoid hitting you. Again, back to back to safety guys, but the safety thing you can't, you know, expect somebody to react or order understand your intentions in a split second. I mean, because even initially when he established the overlap greens kind of still heading towards blue now. I, I, it, it's, it pretty much stops you from, even though you're the right of way, you can't change course or do anything to avoid that, to stop somebody else from avoiding you. And that's pretty much the crutch of, it's, it's the tacking too close. Here's the, here's the other, here's the example of upwind. So these two boats are overlap sailing upwind. So the yellow boat tacks, completes his tack. But by the time, at, at three is when, Right through two, the yellow boat is tacking, so they're subject to 13. Right at three, yes, they are now on starboard tack, and rule 10 turns on. But as 10 is turning on, the blue boat already can't avoid. Like this. So the old blue boat already has to start avoiding the yellow boat before or just as yellow acquires right away. So it, the, the default here and the disqualification is on yellow for tacking too close because the blue boat did not have time or, or room to react to the yellow boat acquiring right away. So this is a clear case of rule 15. Um, because remember, you also don't have to anticipate. The, the blue boat does not have to anticipate what the yellow boat's going to do. The yellow boat doesn't acquire its right of way until it's completed that tack. So it needs to complete its tack and still have time at the completion of that tack for blue to avoid it. It's pretty much what rule 15 is saying. Does that make sense? Um, that, that's pretty much uh, the same thing as, I think this is another one of these, like the same example like before where, where they're not overlapped and an overlap develops quickly. And then all of a sudden did somebody changes course very fast or, or establish the overlap so close. I think this is the demonstration here is between one and two, two puts his bow. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, the blue boat puts his bow so close to the yellow boat when he establishes the overlap that there's no place for, for the yellow boat to turn. If the yellow boat at that point was to go up just him, it would swing his stern. Remember when you turn a boat, the stern moves down. So since the blue boat put his nose so close for the yellow boat to keep clear, if he turns up, he hits him. If he turns down, he hits him. He put the yellow boat in a no-win situation while acquiring right away. So that's why that one's kind of there. Um, so that's 15, I would do 15. We talked about 16 a little bit already. Um, 16 is pretty much changing course, pretty much says you can't change course as the right away boat in a manner that doesn't allow other people to keep clear. Uh, like I said, this is another safety thing. Uh, we talked kind of about this before. We're not going to spend too much time as the old, like we said, the old hunting rule kind of thing. Um, 
you can see like the green boat there really doesn't because he turns again it's probably pretty it looks like the green boat gonna duck right it looks like he's gonna let the guy go but then he makes a course change and now the blue boat the red boat can't avoid because he heads all the way back up uh we kind of talked about that one or the fast luff um but the boat doesn't even have a, a really chance or room you can't just turn the boat so fast into the blue boat that the blue boat doesn't have time to time to react um so there's a bunch of those. It's like I said, it's another, it, it, think about the safety thing. If I, if I make, it's pretty much stops you from doing anything too, too drastic that another boat can't anticipate or avoid. Hence keeping the boats apart from each other. Okay. Um, now there is some, rule 17 is an important one. Uh, we're gonna like, this is the one that Rand kind of talked about in his question there. Um, same tack, proper course. Um, this scenario comes up uh, most of the time on a little bit more on, on downwind legs more often, uh, or maybe on a, a reaching leg. Generally, it doesn't come up too much on an upwind leg. Uh, but pretty much, this is a restriction on one of the three magic scenarios where two boats are on the same tack and they are overlapped or become overlapped. Uh, it also it pretty much deals with also the change. So. Uh, we're we're going to look at some here. So here's the, here's the rule. I'm going to read this one. This way you can kind of, because the wording of this is important. If a boat clear astern, so somebody from behind becomes overlapped within two hull lengths to leeward of the boat on the same tack, she shall not sail above her proper course while they remain on the same tack and overlapped within that distance, that distance being the two boat lengths. Unless in doing so, she promptly sails astern of the other boat. This rule does not apply if the overlap begins while the windward boat is required by rule 13 to keep clear. So pretty much you can't tack your way into this. If, if you tack or jibe, uh, you pretty much turn this rule off. So, um, so let's look at what that kind of means. So Here's, here's, a, here's a pretty good example of exactly what it means here. So at position one, uh, the yellow boat is clear astern of the blue boat. There's no overlap at that initial spot. Uh, I tried to, sometimes you can pause these, sometimes I won't. Um, so at that point, right now, rule 12 is on, right? At, at, at position one, the yellow boat is clear astern, blue boat's clear ahead, they're on the same tack, rule 12. Now, as position two establishes itself, uh, that pretty much turns on rule 11. Okay, so now there's an overlap. Position two, the, bow, the back of the blue boat is, if you drew the line across, would be crossing over to uh, the yellow boat. So now rule 11 turns on. Now in this special circumstance, because yellow established its overlap from behind and to leeward, kind of right at position two there of the blue boat, there's special restrictions on the yellow boat. And these are the restrictions on the rule 17 that come up. Uh, and it pretty much restricts the yellow boat, which is the right away boat, from sailing above their proper course. Okay, or pretty much restricts them to sail their proper course. Their proper course is the course they would sail in the absence of the blue boat. So um, pretty much the, the, this, if the proper course was for both of these boats to continue sailing the way they were at position one and position two towards the bottom of the page, that's where the mark was, that's great for their conditions. Um, the yellow boat would be breaking rule 17 by taking the blue boat above proper course for the yellow boat. This is an interesting caveat that they added a couple of years ago. It used to actually be the, the old, this is almost like the old master beam rule. If you're a really old sailor, um, they, they took that away because that was an arbitrary thing about where people were sitting and things like that. So this pretty much replaced the old master beam rule. I know I'm dating myself now. Probably a lot of people are like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, this pretty much replaced that. So it pretty much means if you come in from behind you can't just stick your nose in there because you're coming up from behind. You're almost like the over, 
overtaking is not a technical term anymore, but you're kind of the overtaking boat. So you can't just stick your nose in from behind underneath somebody and take them up um, beyond your proper course. So, and the overlap does have to be created within the two boat lengths. So you see like they're, they're kind of close to each other here. So that's why rule 17 got turned on. Um, you can jive, you can turn uh, 17 off. If the overlap gets broken and reestablished, depends on how that can turn 17 off. If you jibe or, or tack, it pretty much that's what that last sentence is. Uh, you can turn 17 off. Sometimes you'll see that's a tactical decision. Sometimes you'll see two boats sailing downwind. Well, one boat will jibe for five seconds, not even. Pretty much take the mainsail, throw it over, sail 10 feet and jibe back. Well, you now changed how the overlap was established and you can turn rule 17 off. Uh, so like I said, sometimes knowing the rules can help you make a tactical decision um, very different. So that's the, we're gonna look at, we'll look at another couple, another couple of uh, ones here. So like, here's another kind of thing. Um, same thing, blue and yellow are selling down when yellow establishes an overlap from behind. If you look at one, look, there was no overlap. You look at two, there's now an overlap. Uh, and heads up to get a large puff down when blue heads it down yellow. There's no contact. Blue alleges broke rule 17. Yellow floods a protest. This is a close one. Now, if, if yellow can make a case that if the blue boat wasn't there and they were just sailing up to go catch a puff, then the blue boat breaks the rule uh, by not keeping clear. But the yellow boat's pretty much on them to, to, to compel a, a committee or somebody to say, if uh, I would have done this in the absence of the blue boat. And it's pretty much the, the crux of the rule. So let's see what we can see what they, yellow did not break since her overlap was attained from clear head. Uh, so no higher than a problem. In this situation, yellow's proper course is to sail into the puff. Um, so blue not keeping clear, pretty much. Um, so they, they ruled in that case that he didn't break the, the rule because of, because of the puff. They were able to, to say that they didn't, uh, in the absence of the blue boat, that's the course the yellow boat would have sailed. Um, and that's pretty much what the rule is. And it's the it's the leeward boat's proper course, not the windward boat's proper course. Hey, Frank, uh, yes. Ron brings up an interesting question in today's per fleets where we're mixing uh, sprit boats with symmetrical. Right. And just wanted you to maybe add that dimension to the dialogue here, please. Okay, yeah, well, that the, the last sentence that I just said is pretty much what dictates that. It's the leeward boat's proper course. So if the yellow boat was a symmetrical boat and the blue boat, uh, the yellow boat was an asymm boat and wanted to sail a higher angle and the blue boat was a symmetrical boat and wanted to sail dead, dead wind, it's whatever the leeward boat, the right of ways boat, the boat that has rights under rule 11 because they're really leeward boat, uh, their proper course. So if that's a sprit boat, that it, their proper course is to race around, you know, at 45 degree angles downwind, and you don't want to sail 45 degree angles downwind, and you're the blue boat, you're stuck. Um, yeah, and that does come up more and more often, and that's kind of why we, we stress that too. So it's it's the leeward boats. I don't know if there's a. Uh... Okay, so here's here's the here's when it doesn't work okay uh, so in this kind of scenario um and why and what this differs from the last one so you have at one the blue boat is clearly stern of the yellow boat at two they're kind of getting no just almost overlapped right so at two they're just almost overlapped at three they're clearly overlapped at four the yellow boat takes the blue boat up and and, and defends What's different in this scenario than in the previous scenarios? And the difference is on how the overlap was established. The blue boat now established the overlap or the overlap was established to windward of the yellow boat. You see how the blue boat goes above the leeward boat to create the overlap? Under that scenario, the yellow boat is 
rule 17 does not apply and the yellow boat can take the blue boat up as high as they want. So if you look at the difference in it, just to do this, of, see the yellow boat here goes below the blue boat, that turns on 17. In this example, by the blue boat going above the yellow boat, rule 17 does not get turned on. And that's really, it, that's why it's important to understand when, when, you, when you, an overlap gets created, and like I said, most of these kind of things happen downwind, understand how the overlap got created is very important. Um, and then even in this example is another fun one. When they both turn down at six again, just, be, just by the boats turning, you can break an overlap or create an overlap as well. So, um, so it's overlap, it's overlap, it's yellows right away. And then even as they turn down, as six turns, now they break the overlap. So then now it's clear stern again for the blue boat. And if another overlap establishes itself at that point, you have to look how that new overlap gets established. Um, that's why you, a lot of times you have people on a course called no overlap or, or I broke the overlap. Um, it, it kind of uh, plays into that too. So when an overlap gets created, take note of how it got created when it gets created and that's that'll answer your question did is 17 on or not um and and then you have to think you apply 17 17 on or 17 20 it's either it's on or not it's kind of yes or no but you need to know you can't like be overlap with somebody for five minutes and then things start happening and go well how did this get us how did these get established as us being overlapped when overlaps get, they take note when the overlap gets established or, or so you can know if, do I want to break this, not break it? Do I got somebody that like in this situation, the guy went above me, now you're in control as a yellow boat. You're okay that he went that way. Um, Cause he can kind of, this is, they call this protecting the lead. So you can kind of hold the guy out. Um, so here's the, here's the magic jibe one. I talked about being on a different jibe for a second. So at one, uh, the yellow boat's clear astern, the blue boat's clear ahead, rule 12 is on. Okay, at position two, the blue boat, the yellow boat just establishes an overlap. He establishes it to leeward, he establishes it from behind. So 17 would be on at position two. Now, the yellow boat decides to jibe. At right when, when the yellow boat is on port tack, now you have two boats on opposite tacks. They are no longer overlapped. When the yellow boat jibes back, now they're overlapped and the overlap gets created by the jibe or change in tack. Now the yellow boat is not obliged by rule 17 or restricted and can take the blue boat any place they want. That's why if you ever see somebody do that to you, you'll see it happen. Just take the main sail, throw it across for six seconds, not even, oh, I was on that tack. Well, now I'm back on that tack. Now I just changed, I just turned off rule 17. So that little move by the yellow boat turned off rule 17 now allows them as the lured boat to sail wherever they want. So that's a little, the double jibe is a little tactical situation um, that can help uh, go through that. So that's 17, 17 is kind of important. Like I said, it, it, this is something that did change a while ago. If, you, if you're coming back to sailing, it was kind of the old master beam rule. Um, so 18, we're gonna talk about 18 for, for a minute. Uh, but before we go and look at the rules part of this, we're gonna, we're gonna make this a little fun. Um, well, I had a couple of videos, but well, th th this is a good video of what not to do on port starboard situation in a uh, <laughs> dream selling series. Um, but I did a couple of those. So Alenghi was on starboard and the Red Bull boat was on port. And that's what happens when you miss on a port starboard when you're doing 30 knots. Um, Try not to do that. But we want to look at a couple of other. Here's another. Well, I, I won't show that one. That one's kind of sad. So it's another port starboard. Uh, and, and I talk about the safety of these things. Those are two B-52s with one of them landing and another one. Uh, the reason we do this is safety. I mean, you, you, these are big boats. We, we all sell big boats that weigh a lot, especially like you watch on this video, how close this sprit comes to you know hitting people. It literally rips the wheel out of the driver's hand. So you want to watch the wheel get ripped out of the driver's hand. So you pretty much, it, th these things exist for your safety. Knowing the rules is important. 
Um, we could look a couple of these. So um, here's a, this, these are a bunch of shields. Uh, we'll look at a couple of rules here. They're about to get to a weather mark. So this is kind of a good example for how 18 works at a weather mark. Um, we can open this up here so we can. So a couple of rules you see going on here, right? So you got a whole bunch of boats that are on port tack. So we got, there's another boat coming on starboard. They got rule 10 between those two, but looks like 74 is gonna make it. Uh, that's clean, he's good. You got at the top of the screen here, you got a couple of boats coming on starboard. It's gonna start a chain reaction of boats. So um, that 156 tacking there, tacks before the starboard tack boat looks pretty clean. Now 74 is coming. Now we got another port starboard, 74 tacks in, in what looks like is a pretty clean. The distance didn't affect the boat above him. Um, so that's a clean tack. And now you have a whole bunch of boats on starboard. Now between all the boats on starboard, you have boats that are overlapped. 74 is overlapped with 156. Uh, the next two boats are overlapped with each other. Um, and then they're about to come into a mark, which at the, the three boat length is zone will turn on rule 18 between a bunch of boats. Um, and we'll look at kind of that the mark comes up in a little bit. All right, so here we go. So there's the mark in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. The boats are just about getting to the three boat length circle. So rule 18 is about to turn on. Uh, so you have boats coming in or starboard tech lay line. Two, two, six. Now boat 217 is on port tack and has no rights over anybody uh, coming in on that starboard tack ley line. Now, even after he tacks onto starboard, because he tacked in the zone, he still cannot stop anybody that was on that starboard tack ley line from making the mark safely, even though he's now on starboard. Uh, they could almost make a case that he caused bad air for other boats there that were uh, on the starboard tack ley line. Uh, it's a tough case to prove. Um, but you see, as the boats start piling up, all the inside boats pretty much have rights over the outside boats. And that's pretty much how 18 kind of works. Um, there's a couple more people attacking there, but it starts getting crazy. Uh, I won't do so many videos. And if you want to see what happens in a large J24 fleet, well, I'll turn it. So this is approaching a starboard tack ley line in a large J24 fleet. Uh, I think from uh, 2019 Worlds. And you see what happens when the boats start coming through on. So that was really close to being a foul there by Port Starboard. The mark's coming up, so the boats are just getting into the zone. And then you get this guy comes in here and slams the boat in and hits that guy. So what rule? That guy in the middle that just broke 13 for sure. Um, and then in the process of breaking 13, because now he's tacked in his own and a spot he shouldn't be in, he hits another boat, um, probably breaking rule 18, because he hit a boat that was a clear ahead uh, and there was no room to give him an overlap. So um, it, these situations, look, and they're all still piled up over by the mark. Uh, and now this boat here that we're kind of monitoring, he's now got to find a hole in the starboard tack parade, uh, and they're just losing boats like crazy. They got to duck every one of these boats until they find the hole to tack in that's clean. And they finally find one here where they're able to complete their tack before fouling another, before hitting another boat. Um, that's just crazy stuff from sailing in big fleets of why these rules are so important. Um, and then we'll give we'll one more quick little video here that we'll do. These are, um, these are J70s. They're sailing downwind. This is going to be a downwind mark rounding. Uh, and they're all trying to go around this yellow mark here. Pretty much, I would say, like the zone is probably where this boat 250 is here, kind of starting about three boat lengths away. Um, this guy's actually going to probably cause some havoc in a minute. Uh, this is kind of why I'm pointing him out. I also want to look at where, say, this boat is here. This boat becomes 09, and we see we see what 09 ends up in this mess in a second. So. Uh, are people taking advantage of the rules. So everything looks pretty good up until this point. Everybody's playing pretty playing along. Uh, this boat kind of cuts a little close, but you know, he doesn't foul 108 because 108 didn't have to avoid. Now this guy was the guy that was in the middle of that mess that was in the back of the picture that was, oops, where is it?
This guy, 37, is the guy you're going to see in the middle of the pile up in a second. Now, all of these boats that entered the zone clear ahead of him have rights over him. All these boats to the right, the boat to 369, which is going to be bow nine, that almost hits him in a second. So bow 37 coming in here late, it's got no rights whatsoever on all the boats that entered the zone ahead of him and not overlapped, which is pretty much almost everybody on the right side of the picture. I know we can't see the setup before that, but it's pretty safe to assume that. So. This is what happens when the guy just tries to throw it at this. There's that 09 guy that was way ahead. He's got every right to close this guy out. And the guy just throws the boat in there, causing 09 now to sail up to avoid him. He ends up hitting another boat, probably hits the mark, I believe, in the aftermath. Um, but now that guy in 09 has got to fight. Now he's got a, to kind of get, uh, because now he hit another boat. There's probably going to be protests between him. And now he's got to get. That, that guy's going to protest the guy in the middle. The guy in the middle is going to protest the other guy. And it starts going down the chain. Uh, but you can see what kind of calamity you can cause by throwing the boat in there when you shouldn't. Uh, all right, let me, that's kind of the. So you can see why you need these rules in Rule 18 uh, in a couple of different situations there. We'll look at some of the simulations. Rule, t, real, rule 18s are really, I mean, they even broke it up into a couple of different sections here. So. Uh, rule 18 is pretty much marks. And this is the last and really important one. The next one's obstructions. Uh, we'll look at that real quick, but we don't have to go too crazy. Okay, rule 18, one eight, rule 18 applies. Um, rule 18 applies between boats when they're required to leave a mark on the same side. And at least one of them is in the zone. That zone is what I talked about before. Uh, for most big boats is three boat lengths from the boat that gets there first. Um, and some other classes, it's different lengths just for speed. RC lasers, we sell four boat lengths, uh, but that's why it just says zone because zone is defined between whatever. So it does not apply, does not apply. This is a little caveat to read this carefully. A lot of people read this wrong. It does not apply between boats on opposite tacks on the beat to windward. Hence the guy on the starboard port tack ley line come and attack uh, in the zone has no rights over the boat that's on starboard. So this just kind of said, since 18.1 does not apply opposite tax, rule 10 applies, port starboard. So pretty much you don't have to let the guy in. Uh, between boats and opposite tax, when the proper course is to mark for one, but not both of them is to tack. So if one guy's just making it and the other guy's not making it and that other guy's got a tack, eh, no, no, no good. Uh, between boats approaching a mark and one leaving it. This is a big one. Um, you know, a boat that's sailing upwind as somebody comes around a mark and starts sailing downwind. 18 does not apply. Uh, you go back to basic port starboard, windward leeward. Um, so that pretty much got to get away from that. The, the, the mark will mark room or rule 18 does not apply. Uh, the mark is a continuing obstruction and then rule 19 deals with it. Um, so that's 18.1 is pretty much knowing when the rule turns on. Uh, so here we talk about the zone. Uh, okay, so here's a quick little example. Uh, we'll do a little, so the, here's two boats sailing towards a mark, the yellow boats on starboard, the blue boats on port. Rule 18 does not apply, even though they're in the zone because they're on opposite tacks required to leave a mark in the same direction. So. Okay, um, blue 18, so we have two boats here on starboard tack. They've both hit the zone. They're overlapped when they hit the zone. So rule 18 turns on. Okay, um, here's another, doesn't really matter. If the, just because the uh, blue boat got into the zone first, as long as they don't tack, they will still rule 18 to have turned on because uh, they're clear ahead because he doesn't need to tack. Um, and pretty much the same kind of circles and things upwind are gonna apply um, downwind. So, and that's an obstruction, we're not gonna look obstruction. Okay, so now, now we're also gonna look at one of the other things you gotta think about. What, it, it's a little easier upwind. Um, 
to know when somebody's in the zone and, and, and to see the angle of the back of your boat because you're generally going to be on the same tack as somebody, uh, whether you're determining if you have an overlap or not, because if a boat's got a tack, they're going to break their, they're going to lose their overlap, uh, lose their protections under 18. Um, downwind is when it gets a little interesting, especially uh, when we start sailing sprit boats or asymmetrical boats that's sailing pretty high angles. Um, so in this scenario here, uh, the yellow boat has reached the zone. Uh, and if you draw a magic line off the back of yellow's boat at that moment that they reach the zone, it would actually capture the blue boat, even though the blue boat seems like it's much further away. So this technically would turn rule 18 on, um, even though the boats are fairly far apart. Now, if yellow can easily get around the mark before without impeding blue, you really don't have to give them much room. But if blue it kind of comes in here fast and you have a bad spinnaker takedown or something, you have to technically give the blue boat room if you're the yellow boat to round that mark if you're rounding the, the gate to, to port. Um, so finish, same thing. Uh, the the buoy on a, on a finish line is, is the mark of the course. So uh, the boat, the blue boat is in the zone. Um, so the yellow boat, uh, they are overlapped. So the yellow boat has to let the blue boat in to finish the race. Um, okay, so that's pretty much when it turns on and we're gonna look. The other thing I wanna to think about the, um, before I kind of, we, we get to the rest of this. I kind of, this is kind of, I wanted to kind of give an example of 18 of kind of what you think about it, going back to like the safety issue uh, and how to think about 18 a little bit before we get totally in here. So here's my little example. Of, you're driving a car and it, it's a double turn lane. This happens in Jersey all the time and all over the place. There's a million of these things all over the place. When you're driving your car and you, and you get to a double turn lane and it, you're starting to turn. So like you're, you're essentially at the zone because you're pretty much now established that whatever's not much is going to change forward back, right? The outside car is not going to be ahead of the front car or backwards. You're going into this turn, double turn lane with somebody outside of you. Pretty much what's going to dictate where you got to go. If you're the inside car, the car on the, on the left here, the, the guy on the outside can't force you to hit anything. So they pretty much, the guy on the outside has got to leave you a clear path to turn your car through the street and come out in his own lane uh, and leave room for that inside guy. The outside guy has got to pretty much let the, let the guy go and come out in his spot. Um, the inside guy has got obligations too. He can't just, you know, drive wildly wide and not, you know, leave room for the outside guy to go around. So he's got obligations, just like you would in, in any kind of a turning situation like this. And if there was more boats, you just keep piling them out there. But pretty much at this moment is when you're setting yourself up for that turn. Like when you get to that circle or to the intersection, you've pretty much established, hey, I got somebody on my outside or I got somebody on my inside. I got to give a little room. I need a little space. I got to make sure I leave. If you were the only car there, or if you were clear ahead of all the cars, it wouldn't matter where you turned because you know you're clear ahead of everybody. If you if you wiggled out of your lane a little bit, it wouldn't affect anybody. Um, also, at this point, would it make sense that another car could come up behind the two and try and cut inside you? No, because you've established your position of what it's safely going to do for you to navigate that turn, and that's pretty much what Rule 18 is doing: is how to go manage the turn. Uh, safely and effectively and, and at a defining moment of you know three boat lengths away so you have time to react to actually make the turn safely uh, and, and pretty much gets everybody in their lane at the magic circle so that's kind of like the best way to kind of analyze I know and then with some caveats I to the details of sailing and changing it but it's pretty much the best way to associate it uh, to, and just think about it in a safe situation. Because like I said, all the rules are based on what makes sense safety-wise. Hey, Frank, before you go off this, there's a question on sure. where the yellow and blue were overlapped. Um, I think it says we're coming to the mark. Um, and the question was, would, would, would not port starboard apply? So I, I think um, it was a downwind. I because don't exactly. the boats are sailing more than 90 degrees away from the wind while they're sailing downwind, 
uh, and in the zone. That, that's a caveat for that of why the boats are on opposite tacks and why it works. So, um, so you. Since both boats are required to leave a mark on the same side and one of them is in the zone, uh, none of the rule 18-1 exceptions apply. Um, because remember of the difference in 18-1, so we go back to the, where's the, okay. Uh, so do any of these apply? Between boats on opposite tacks on a beat to windward, the boats are sailing downwind. They are not on a beat to windward. Um, so that's pretty much why when in a downwind situation, this doesn't turn on. Between boats on opposite tacks, when a proper course at the mark for one of them is not both the tacks. So we're not talking about it. So um, at least one of them has to tack, uh, but approaching mark not leaving. So it doesn't turn on any of the exceptions because of the one the 18 one specifically says on a beat to windward. So that's why the tacking on an upwind mark, you know, doesn't get you to 18, but a jibe at a leeward mark will turn 18 on. Does that answer your question? So go ahead, Steve. Does that answer your question? No, it uh, doesn't exactly. Uh, I was looking at the diagram. Both boats are overlapped with each other. Um, which which diagram are you looking at? Uh, they were on the, watch, Steve? The, the blue was way behind and up to the left of the yellow. I think I think it's the one uh, downwind mark where oh um, blue is out. Seven or circle. seven or eight, Steve. Yeah, which one were we talking about then? <laughs> um, but in either case, I, I, let's look at eight. Um, it looks like they're overlap with each other. Right. One is on port, one is on starboard. Correct. So haven't we established port starboard rights here? No, because we haven't turned 18 off. The boat is in the zone. Okay. So if you go back to the, the, the list of examples, right? So rule attainment plans one uh, required are required to leave mark on the same side and at least one of them is in the zone. However, it does not apply. See, this is, remember, it's a does not apply. All of these have to not apply. The boats are on opposite tacks on a beat to windward, does not apply. So the opposite tack goes out the window. Between boats and opposite tacks, when a proper course at the mark for one but not two, this is actually almost like if you're doing like uh, port starboard roundings, upwind, it gets weird. Uh, one boat's approaching, not leaving, or both approaching the mark, and it's not an obstruction. So that pretty much 18-1 is on because these don't apply. So 18 applies. Yes. So we'll go back to says what exactly? Well, and then we're going to go to what happens at 18. So that's pretty much the 18-1 is the does it apply or not? And then we're gonna talk about what happens on giving mark room as 18-2 and, and what happens when they apply, so. so. Basically, you have to give him room to finish is, is what that is saying. Right. Or, or room around the mark or, or right. Yes, to, yes. Right. Um, all right, so giving 18-2. So 18-2 is pretty much what happens after you've established that 18 is on, okay? So first caveat, when boats are overlapped, the outside boat shall give the inside boat mark room unless rule 18 to B applies, okay? 18 to B, if the boats are overlapped, when the first one of them reaches the zone, the outside boat at that moment shall thereafter give the inside boat mark room. If the boat is clear ahead when she reaches the zone, the boat clear astern at that moment shall thereafter give her mark room. So pretty much says, okay, if the boats are overlapped, the outside boat's got to give mark room. If B applies, which pretty much says one's clear ahead, they're not overlapped, if you really read it, then 18.2 doesn't apply. Uh, and the boat clear ahead is granted mark room from the boat clear astern can't give. Um, when a boat is required to give mark room by 18.2 B, some of these rules kind of point to each other, which is kind of a little silly. Uh, when a boat is required to give mark room, so when you're required to, but to give mark room here, 
She shall continue to do so if later an overlap is broken or a new overlap begins. This is an important statement. It all, what pretty much this statement means is what, what happens at the moment the first boat hits the zone is locked between the relationship of those boats until they've rounded the mark. So you can't change what happened at that instant. That's the magic moment. The moment the first boat hits the zone. If the moment the first boat hits the zone, the guy is clear ahead and there's no overlap. Even if the boat from behind establishes one after, no good, you're out. Um, so it's pretty much saying that the magic moment is, is not gonna change. So if anything changes um, close to when a boat preaches the zone, the idea is to pretty much go with what was going on before that. Um, if she becomes overlap inside a boat entitled to mark room, she should also give that boat room to sail a proper course while they remain overlapped. So um, if you become overlapped later, well then after this happens, you, you, still, you have to find a way to give the boat mark room. Uh, rule 18B and C, cease to apply if a boat entitled to mark room passes head to wind or leaves the zone, which pretty much um, if, you, if you tack, pretty much tacking would turn off this rule. Um, pretty much that's kind of almost like the one at the windward mark where two boats enter the zone, maybe on starboard, but one of them doesn't make the mark. When that leeward boat tacks, 18 turns off and then we just go back to port starboard. And that's pretty much what that one's saying. Uh, and this is the other key kind of reason. If there is reasonable doubt that a boat obtained or broken overlap in time, it shall be presumed that she did not. Okay, so this pretty much says, okay, approaching the zone for the last five you know for the last minute two boats have been overlapped clearly overlapped and at the last second a boat changes course or does something crazy to try and break that overlap if it's unclear that that overlap's been broken at that moment is to assume that it didn't change so it's pretty much goes that the, if you're in a protest for this, they'll ask you to look back. What was going on the last, you know, 100 yards before that? What was going on the last minute? What was going on the last 20 seconds? They pretty much don't want the situation to clear a stern or, or, or overlap to change at the last moment. And pretty much you're supposed to revert back at that point to what was happened before for, for a consistent amount of time. Um, so if it, if you obtained a late one or you broke one really late and you're not really sure, you could, you, the rule is to presume that it did not change. Um, if a boat obtained inside low overlap from clear astern or by tacking the windward of the other boat, and for the time the overlap begins, the outside boat has been only able to give mark room, she's not required to give it. This requires kind of tacking. We'll see a kind of thing for that. So we'll look at a couple of examples of these. Um, well, well, so here, here's, here's a common, you know, leave, leave a mark, this is a gate, so we're making a right-hand turn. Um, boat one, at, I mean, yellow boat at position one, uh, when their bow hits that three boat link zone, you think about it, they, they make these grids, so like one boat link, so you can kind of see this is one, two, three boat links. At position one, the yellow boat breaks that circle. At that exact moment, the line drawn off of one's transom establishes that the blue boat has an overlap to the yellow boat. Now, from that moment forward, the blue boat is entitled to mark room and the yellow boat must avoid him and give him mark. So you can see kind of they clear out, blue boat, uh, the yellow boat steers a little wide, the blue boat's allowed to go in and, and make his mark rounding, the, the boats don't hit. Uh, but this is the classic downwind that it's all about, like we said, it's about that magic moment when the first boat crosses that plane. And, and that's going to lock the rule in for the rest of the rounding of, of who had mark room. Because you can't really change it at that point. You need, you need to be able to know what's going on. And that's just a safety thing, too. You need time to prepare for your turn. Uh, am I taking the inside lane? Am I taking an outside lane? What lane, am I, what lane do I have to put my boat in? Um, and to safely round the mark at that point. So it's, it's, it goes all back to safety and, and kind of the pinwheel effect. I mean, it's, it's hard to block out the inside boat 
uh, from being able to round the mark safely because that's just the logical path that the inside boat should be able to take. Um, we'll let you brother. If you're on the deck, oh. <laughs> okay. So Ignore here's here. Frank. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's a left-hand turn, and what happens if there is no overlap, right? So at one, right, so we're at one. I got to move my chat window, I'm sorry. At one, um, when the blue boat breaks the barrier of the three boat length zone, there is no overlap to the yellow boat. So now the yellow boat is not entitled to mark room. So the blue boat is entitled, can, can sail his course and sail exactly where he wants to round the Mark. Now he can't sail out of the way. He's got to make a pretty much a, a what they call a tactical rounding, or, or, or the room he's granted is to round the mark. It's not to just extraneously sail where he wants to sail. But blue boat was entitled to mark rune. He rounds the mark. He does nothing wrong. The yellow boat um, was not entitled to room, so they had to bail out and do this. And, and pretty much nobody should be disqualified because there wasn't a collision. The yellow boat avoided. Uh, and the blue boat did nothing wrong. Um, but this is another case of, like you say, establishing that overlap late. Now, if you look at like two, they're overlapped, but not at one. Even though they established that overlap late, the overlap gets established. It's after that magic time that happened at the three boat link circle. So it's all about that magic three boat link circle and when the first boat gets there. Um, so here's another one with the, the kind of the, here's the asymmetrical situation, right? Uh, where you're sailing these big angles. So boats that are, when you're sailing these kind of angles, I don't know why I'm getting some weird. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting something weird on my headset. Um, boats that are sailing wide angles now, there's a lot more boats that you capture when you hit that zone, because your your trailing edge line off your off your back of your boat captures a wide area of boats. So at the magic spot here at one, uh, when the blue boat crosses the zone, they are overlapped with the yellow boat, even though they're pretty far away. And this is kind of a thing. So the blue boat is do uh, is entitled to mock room. And the yellow boat pretty much doesn't grant it, doesn't give the, the blue boat a chance to go in inside and round the mark. The yellow boat should be disqualified, and the blue boat gets to sail on. So, Frank, uh, Steve, Steve C asks the question about how do you establish either the existence or Zoom the lack? I don't know, I'm getting something weird. Um, okay, so that's that. Here's another kind of common one. This is where the, the inside guy. And it goes back to sailing wide angles. At one, the yellow boat's line goes up and it does capture the blue boat. The blue boat needs room. He's not given the room that he needs. He avoids hitting them because he, he avoids the collision. Uh, the blue boat should go back and reround the mark to solve his string problem. Um, so here's another one going around the other mark with the other boat. So at, at one, the blue boat hits the zone. If you look, the yellow boat's overlapped, even though they're a little bit behind, they're overlapped. The yellow boat's entitled to mark room and he's not given his mark room. So uh, that's a protest on the blue boat and should be disqualified. Okay, so now the, here's a kind of an interesting one where a boat's got rights, but they, you know, have a bad takedown. So at one, the blue boat's in the zone, clearly no overlap with the yellow boat. The blue boat has a terrible takedown. Like I said, they get dragged way down the mark and they hunt up all the way down, going past the mark. The yellow boat at that point is not expected to try to avoid him because the blue boat's not sailing their proper course around the mark and not taking the mark room to, they're entitled to. They're just taking too much room. So as long as the yellow boat doesn't impede the blue boat and the blue boat can come up to close hold course and sail their proper course, uh, either the mark, the yellow boat didn't foul them. So a lot of times you can take advantage of this. You see somebody having a bad takedown or whatever and, and you have a good takedown, you can get up inside of them. I don't know why I'm getting something in my ear. 
That's strange. Um, so that's a lot of 18 examples. Okay, now here's a, here's the example of the pass out, right? We, we discussed how, um, when we were talking about rule 11, how overlaps get passed down from boat to boat to boat. Well, the same rule applies for when establishing overlaps for a mark rounding. So at position one, the yellow boat breaks the zone. He's overlapped with the green boat. So yellow's overlapped with the green, but the green is also overlapped with the blue. So now the blue boat actually has mark room on the green boat and the yellow boat. It gets passed down, just like that the overlap gets passed down. If one boat's overlapped with that boat and the next boat overlapped with the next boat, the pass down happens just like as if you were sailing upwind. So the same rules, uh, pretty much in this scenario, the yellow boat pretty much breaks 18 because they did not allow the blue boat mark room to sail around the mark. So it kind of gets passed out as you get multiples. This is a really crazy example. You can go through and watch the whole thing. It kind of gets nuts. Um, you can start having all kinds of implications because boats are not really in the zone and things. We're very rarely at our fleet racing gonna run into situations where you have five, six, seven, eight boats um, going around things. So uh, that's 18.2. Any questions for 18.2 before we, let's see, we have anything in the chat? Yeah, Frank, two, two items. One is- um, Overlap does not that the that is only the definition of um, hull it was only done for finish and for start so that, that changes there the overlap is any part of the boats overlap so it could be a spinnaker it could be a sail it could be a sprit it doesn't matter it's not the, not used that same definition is not used for finish or start of hull. It's anything that's overlapped, it's overlapped. Spritz, sales, things like that all apply. Okay. So that's 18.2. 18.3 is a little easier. Um, and 18.4. I don't know why I'm getting weird. So 18.3 is passing head to wind in the zone. Okay. So pretty much you're tacking in the zone. Um, when we attack in the zone, it turns off 18.2, like we saw previously in the definition. Um, but you can still attack in the zone, and then afterwards you end up overlapping is pretty much where the key points are. So 18.3 eliminates the mark room position for 18.2 by boats approaching when mark on a on, uh, mark on port tack uh, and presents chaotic situations. Um, if you tack from port to starboard in zone and are fetching the mark, you cannot cause boats coming in on starboard to sail above close hull. Um, this is true even if you complete your tack clear ahead of the starboard tack boats. Uh, if you tack from port to starboard in the zone, you must give room uh, to boats overlapped inside of you if they are on starboard since entering the zone. So here's a couple of examples. So at one, uh, the blue boat's in the zone, at two, the blue boat's in the zone, the two, the yellow boat's in the zone. Blue tacks while in the zone and causes the yellow boat to sail above close hull. They've broken rule 18.3 and the blue boat should be disqualified. Even though we completed his tack clear ahead, even though all those things kind of happen at three, you can see he's clear ahead. He still, because of his actions, caused the other boat to have to avoid him and sail above close hold. The blue boat's disqualified. Um, so here's another, here's the other example of, and, and this is another tactical thing too, and, and, and a good example. In this situation, the blue boat goes clear through the yellow boat and doesn't tack underneath them, allows the yellow boat to finish sailing to the mark unimpeded, gives them room to round the mark and it ends up right next to them. That's legal. There is no rule broken there because the yellow boat didn't have to alter the course um, to sail around the mark. Maybe a touch or whatever, but it, it's it's not, it, I don't think, it, I think that was designed in the animation, but, um, and the blue boat ended up, or, and the yellow boat ended up overlapped inside of them. So uh, that's pretty much the passing head to wind in the zone. 
um, where you can kind of get away with it. And this is one of those tacky, tiki tacky situations that you have to prove is this situation here where, where the yellow boat is overstood, right? The yellow boat's coming in from way above the ley line. If you look at the ley line, the blue boat can tack in there. And um, as long as the yellow boat does not have to sail above close hauled, your the blue boat's okay. So it's okay that the yellow boat had to change course, but if you notice it didn't change course above close hauled, that allows the blue boat to go in here. This is a fun one to prove though, is the blue boat. Because the first question out of race committee's mouth were, okay, if you're the blue boat, so where were you? Well, I was on port tack in the zone. Well, that automatically, you know, is pushing you to possibly have to deal with, uh, you know, some serious issues because uh, now you got to prove your, it's almost like you got to prove your innocence again. Because the last thing they really want you to do is be tacking in the zone. Um, okay, so here's another one. This, that's 18.3 is tacking in the zone. 18.4 is jibing in the zone. Um, it pretty much says when an in, uh, inside overlap right away boat must jibe in a mark to sail her proper course. She shall, um, until she jibes, she sails not uh, further from the mark than needed. So pretty much means you can't use your rights as the inside boat to sail further than you need. So the yellow boat here it hits the zone at position one, is overlapped, is entitled to mark room, but the yellow boat can't just sail to oblivion and not do what's proper to round the mark. Um, the yellow boat probably should have jibed uh, at, the, at, the, at the position three, which would have been their ley line to the, mark, to, to the next mark and not forced the blue boat so far and wide. So pretty much that's what 18.4 says is if you have to drive, you can't take extra room to do it, which kind of makes sense too. I mean, the blue boat sailor is expecting to go around the mark, expecting you to turn around the mark. You can't just keep sailing away from the mark and forcing them out. Back to almost safety kind of thing. 18.4 um, only applies when there's a single mark. It does not apply at a gate because you don't necessarily know which mark anybody's going to. Um, there's no obligation that the green boat has to go and make a left-hand turn here. He could keep going straight and go over to the other mark or the yellow boat can still even if they wanted to go to the other mark, probably wouldn't make sense to, but they have that right. So you're not obligated to jive there. That's what that one's kind of showing there. That's why the rule gets turned off at a key. Um, that's 18, that should pretty much get you around the mark. Let's think about it safety wise. Inside boat, once 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 you're established, you're at the mark. If there's a boat inside you. Pretty much gotta let them go. If you're clear ahead, you're good. Uh, if you're clear behind, you're good. If not, you gotta give room. That's pretty much the summation of 18 uh, and the passing head to win. Okay, we're gonna do one or two more, and then I think that we've about had it because it's been. Uh, I don't know. I think we're starting to die here. Um, the only, only two left is like of 19 and 20s obstructions. Um, I'm not going to go too crazy. What did I do? I lost my. Ah. What did I have? Did I lose my. Menu bar. Oh. Where did I? Um, like I said, there's all kinds of things on here that you can look at. You can look at every rule that you really wanted to. Um, there, there's all these videos. There's in-depth videos in each one of those um, things. In each one of these, you can watch the main video uh, and they give all kinds of examples. Like I said, if you have questions, you can go back and read any of these. They're all done very well. Um, okay, so 19 is room to pass an obstruction. This is a, goes back to a safety thing. You can't force somebody to hit an obstruction. Um, pretty much obstructions can be when an obstruction uh, can, obstructions are marked, the boats are required to leave on the same side. Uh, race committee boats can be obstructions at times. Um, Rocks, things, land, uh, boundaries. Like I, when we saw at Raritan that the, the mooring fleet's a, an a continuing obstruction because you're not allowed to enter the, the line that connects all the boats. Um, 
we have also we have rules you're not supposed to sail through the channel uh past past the, the, the red nuns on the way outside so obstructions come up uh especially where we sail um and, and goes from there so pretty much it define when it when, when it applies because i'm not going to read every word uh giving up room and an obstruction a right away boat may choose to pass an obstruction on either side uh we actually had this one come up at moment boat club the other night um pretty much as a well, i think there's an example of this so well, what's that one mean so this 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 one here so this this mark here is is not a mark of the course this is just something that the boats have to avoid hitting that's in the way it could be a rock pile a mark lighthouse uh, a fishing boat it could be anything that government mark right so you got two boats that are approaching um pretty much as you can see from the line the yellow boat is the leeward boat rule 11 applies they're, they're overlapped so the yellow boat gets to decide which way to go around this now it's up to the yellow boat to make that decision, but whatever decision the yellow boat makes, it must allow the blue boat to make the same decision. So if the yellow boat decided to turn towards the bottom of the page to go around the, the, the mark, the thing, the laughs or whatever, it have to let the blue boat make that same decision and, and leave room for it to go that way. So, but it is the boat that is the right of way boat gets to make the choice. Um, so this is going around a like uh, an obstruction that's surrounded by navigable water because the, the boats would have the option to go around both. Uh, if you're sailing towards, you know, a shoreline, and then that's a different story. That then you know you pretty much only have one way to go, uh, and then you can't trap people in. So which, uh, so that's starting line. That's a flag. We're not going to do starting line points. Uh, so that's obstruction. So now a boat can also be an obstruction too. So here you got three boats sailing upwind, yellow boats on starboard, and you got two boats coming up, approaching the boat on starboard that they have to both give way to. So the yellow boat acts as an obstruction to both of these boats. And they are overlapped. So as boats are overlapped at two, the right of way boat between the blue boat and the green boat get to decide how they want to deal with yellow, the obstruction. If the blue boat wants to tack, they have every right to ask for room to tack and tack and, and, and the green boat has to tack and let the blue boat tack to avoid hitting the yellow boat. But it's up to the blue boat to decide. Now, if the blue boat decided to go behind the yellow boat, it would also have to leave enough room for the green boat to go behind the yellow boat. Um, so it's all about the boat that has the right of way making the decision on how to deal with the obstruction. Um, so like I say, like even a boat can be an obstruction and that's kind of an answer to that and why this one comes up a lot. Uh, and then all the rooms to tack and hails, that's pretty much in rule 20 and it, we, we, I'm not gonna kill it on that one. Uh, whose obligations are when and things like that you can look that up uh here's another one from behind so you're sailing along a shore or the or, or along the mooring field or something that's a long continuous obstruction you cannot if you're establishing an overlap from behind go stick yourself between the obstruction and another boat um, you're pretty much putting yourself in a no-win situation. You're putting yourself putting a, 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 in a pinch point between a, a, a rock and a hard place between a boat and the, and the shore. Um, so that is no good. The, and the yellow boat does not have to let you go in there because it was from behind. So those are some of the caveats to uh, the thing. So here, 20 is room to tack in an obstruction uh, and is the requirements for hailing. Like I said, the two little things there. So like I said, a boat can be an obstruction. Uh, here's a shoreline upwind could be an obstruction. So you got two boats sailing towards a shore, a boundary, uh, anything that's, uh, you can only really pass on one side. So even though, um, so pretty much the yellow boat has to tack before forcing the blue boat into the obstruction. And the, and the blue boat will hail for room to tack and they're gonna tack when they, when they can and kind of simo tack out that way. Um, 
Now the yellow boat doesn't necessarily have to tack to get rid of the blue boat. They just got to avoid and allow the blue boat to avoid the obstruction. So here's another one. Here's a little scenario where the yellow boat was a little further behind. He doesn't want to tack right away for, for whatever reason. It's a little tacked. It'll go a little closer to the shore or whatever. But he can let the blue boat tack, but he has to duck the blue boat because the blue boat had rights to tack to clear the obstruction. And then he can tack a little further up the, the, the obstruction if he wants to so maybe stay in a little cleaner air. Maybe that's a better tactical decision or whatever. Uh, but you got to let the blue boat out pretty much. It's a safety thing. You can't force the guy into hitting the rocks, the beach, or, or whatever place that they can't go. Um, and so that's pretty much the major rules. It's 10 through 20. There's really 10 rules. If you can understand 10 rules, it's 10 pages in the book. And, and, and the definitions of what they mean, uh, you can do pretty much uh, get around a race course safely uh, and legally without doing a lot of things. And like I said, there's a lot of other things in the book that are a lot of procedural things and whatever. Those are things you learn as you go. Focus on the 10 rules um, and, and go and use this site. Look, go through all the videos. If you have questions, there's a great example. Like I said, there's four or five examples for every one of these. There's a main video for every one um, that they go through multiple simulations. All the knowledge has been good. They've all been checked. Um, really good stuff. And I'm going to stop there before I talk for too long. <laughs> so Frank, I'm not sure if you can hear me now or not. Yes, can I got you. you. Oh, wow. OK, great. So we did have one question. And okay. I need to just pull it up for a second. Um, you know what, Rand, why don't you just go ahead and ask it? I'm having a difficult time finding it in the chat. So Rand, why don't okay. you come off mute and go ahead? A lot of times when we race with gates, not necessarily at RYC, but in you know other major regattas, and especially at a downwind gate where you have a lot of boats going on one side or the other and you want clear air, what happens on port and starboard with boats going to opposite ends of the gate as to who has rights? Is it typically um, port starboard or what happens with you know inside? overlapping situations as well. Right, well, generally what happens there is, is you wanna, and, 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 it, and it surely has happened where it hasn't been the case, but you should, they, they should be setting the gates up that they're more than three boat lengths away, more than six boat lengths away, pretty much away from each other. So the zones don't overlap. The zones overlap, you, you make for a very sticky, ugly situation because like you said, you can have boats go into different marks in the zone and, and not in the zone. Um, if the course is set properly and their zones are not you know, overlapping, you're pretty much gonna dictate when the first boat gets to the zone, whichever you got, you got, the rules are gonna apply. Um, and that's the mark you're gonna be, if you're the inside boat, and that's the mark you're going to be entitled to mark room to. If you're not, then, you, you know, but usually by that point, if the marks are far enough apart, it, you're not going to really go to the other one once you're in the zone for the, the one mark. Um, can it get messy when they don't do that? And you all of a sudden you have concentric circles. It gets ugly. Um, to give you a clear, it probably have to look at some of the cases and stuff like that. Like I say, it doesn't happen that often because we should be setting the, we should be setting the race course up the right way. Um, it gets it gets complicated, right? But then if you're not rounding them both or not required to leave the mark on the same side, 18 pretty much is going to turn off, I would believe. And then you're just going to deal with port starboard or whatever, windward lowered, 11, 10, and the base rules because you're not rounding the mark at the same time. You're not, you're not rounding the same mark uh, you're not required to run the same mark at the same time, so 18 would probably turn off. Okay. Because you're not both rounding the same mark. But generally, if you set the buoys far enough apart, you avoid a lot of that hassle because nobody will be in the zone when the boats come together to make that decision, kind of. So, Frank, I, I think that addresses all of the questions. 
Okay. I continue to be amazed at your knowledge of the rules and Sorry, your Sean. ability to go through them and make them easy for the rest of us to understand. So uh, I'm also impressed by your ability to speak for uh, a significant period of time without any break. So very, very impressive. I took Thank my you. three minute break when they did the, uh, <laughs> the thing. John. but no, the, the, the lesson, it, don't, don't get over the, the key lesson here. Don't get over them. Um, I also still want to thank, you know, US sailing. I did borrow a lot of stuff from them. Salesing, especially please um, those, that site, they, they've spent a lot of time. It's all out there for free. You don't even have to register to see it, but it, it register and look at some of it. They do sell some products to help pay for their kind of things. Uh, I bought some telltales from them and some other stuff. I mean, they don't sell a lot of big things, but um, those guys are great. And I just want to thank them. Uh, but like I said, all the animations are there. It's all there. There's also tactics. There's starts. There's upwind, downwind. There's a million things in that page that are, that are really good as, as a source. Um, like I said, a lot of it's based around dinghy stuff, but the dinghy stuff applies just to the big boat stuff just as much. I mean, for, for all the tactics and everything else. I, I think I heard someone trying to ask a question. So whoever it is, please go ahead. Yeah, John, it's Matthew. Uh, you know, we, we've been sailing together on the other pods and this is fantastic information. I'm just like, you know, how much of this actually is applied on regular club racing level. 10 through 20 applies almost every time you leave the dock to go out sailboat racing. Uh, maybe 10 through 18, uh, maybe yeah. the last couple too, but they all they all apply anytime that the section is called when boats meet. Anytime when boats meet on a race course, those rules are gonna apply. Yeah, I mean, and exactly. it comes up constantly. In, in principle, they all should apply all the time, but I can't remember that many times that they actually in practice have been applied. I, I see most of these come up. I mean, mock roundings with other boats, so that's a common situation. It covers all 18. Every time you're sailing upwind and you, you have boats on opposite tacks, 10's applying. Anytime you sail downwind, a lot of times 11, 11, 12, 17, all kind of should be kind of in play if you're near people. Um, mm. Around the starting lines, all the 11 plays into K a lot, um, 10. Um, they, yeah, they come up enough that if, you, if you're going to be out there driving a boat or telling people where to go, that you really should know the 10 rules. And like I said, yeah. don't be worried about the extra 170 pages in the book. <laughs> Get the 10 rules. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Matt, I would just say that when we sail, uh, like Rand's question, definitely I see uh, examples of that when we race, when we're racing through the gates up in Long Island Sound. Uh, but even at RYC, uh, if, if you're ever close to Eric, uh, you'll see several of these rules come into play, usually to your disadvantage. Yes. Um, and even with uh, Mr. Busby, Mr. Busby will apply several of these rules to my disadvantage. And so, me. John, John, last Wednesday was a bit of a bit of a um, yeah. <laughs> Let's not get there. <laughs> It's listen. It, it, there's, there's all kinds of different stages. I mean, you, you gotta just get the basic rules down so that you're at least safe, you know. And people can expect your actions to be consistent with the rules so that they can avoid you in situations. And that's that's the first step. And then the next step is, you know, understanding them a little bit more in depth. So when you're in a little tighter situations, you can, you know, make sure you're doing the right thing. And then the third step is understanding to the point where John was just saying, where you can take advantage of other people that, you know, or take advantage of the rules to make sure you're in the best tactical situation with other boats. Um, and that's when you really need to know them and, and make, make sure you're um, sailing safely, but, you know, push, like pushing, the, being legal, but doing things that, you know, make it get your run a race course faster. And Stryker, Doug Stryker is a good example of one of the people who will, who knows the rules and also uses them to his advantage. Uh, ass hustler. So. <laughs> <laughs> that story is still being told. I just heard the story again last week. <laughs> <laughs> you had to be there. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much, Frank. Thank I appreciate you. it. Lou, I, I don't know if you had anything that you wanted to say to close out, but please, the floor yeah, is yours. I, I, I do real quick. I just want to remind everybody, you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to, to again, we've got some upcoming events. Feel free to join us um, uh, for, the, on, for the 18th and the 25th as the conclusion of our offshore series. I just wanted to also thank... Um, 
thank Frank Scalisi for, for spending the time and going through this. Um, and, and then just put out a, a, a plug for any, any more information for anybody that's not with, you know, with the club, check out our website, reach out to us. Um, and, you know, we always, if you're not familiar with racing, we usually always have spots on a boat. Give us a call a couple of days in advance. We could probably find you, uh, find you a boat. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say about salesing was it's got some also very interesting capabilities on the site where that you can, you can have a, a, a tracker on your boat and upload your track um, that for bo both for, you know, your own boat or for if it's a regatta, a bunch of boats can do it. And you, there, there's spots on the sites where I've seen where, where they'll come and they'll do a play by play and explain the tactics of, of three boats that they're watching the tracks uh, of these boats during a race. So you really can learn a lot from that site. But um, so thank you, Frank, and thank you, everybody else, for, for sticking with us. And hopefully we'll see you on, on the 18th. Yes. And, and listen, you. anytime you want to, if anybody has anything that comes up on the water and you want to get people together to discuss it on a Wednesday night or after a race, even if it's got to be, we could do a mock protest. I mean, it doesn't have to even be official and we get a couple people together. It, it's the best way to learn uh, by asking questions or what That's things right. come up. And, that, that was very good when you did it after frostbiting last year. That was, yeah, we had a little thing come up by frostbiting. We broke out the little things. It wasn't official and we went through the process and you can, you can learn a lot from, you can learn a lot from a protest. It doesn't have to be a nasty, ugly thing, uh, an adversary thing. You can learn. You can learn so much. You should learn something actually out of every protest you're ever involved in. You should learn something. Right, thank you, that. everyone. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for thanks for staying in, and uh, we'll see you again. We'll we'll see you next week. Good night, everybody.